meeting for um, Thursday, August 13th, the City Council meeting to lock it again to, to order. First thing we'll do is, is let's say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can we have a roll call? Mayor Sproul? Here. President Witherspoon? Here. Councilor Brungart? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. Councillor Newman. Here. Councillor Paulson. Here. And Councillor Harper is excused, so you have a quorum, Your Honor. Great. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, and now we'll get the county sheriff. Hi. For those of you who don't know me, I am Deputy Drury. Um, I'm normally the daytime guy, except for summertime. You guys give me this one day, and I'm going back to my day shift. Um, I'm not as cute as McMahon. <laughs> so in order for everybody to hear me, I'm going to remove this. I think I'm a little more than six feet from the both of you. Yeah, All right. So for the stats for this month compared to last year, there were no aggravated assaults, no no burglaries, larceny. There are two, which is still down sixty percent from last year. Uh, there were two motor vehicle thefts. Uh, both those occurred at the car dealership. There were no rapes, uh, which is a total of four compared to last year at seven, with a minus 42%, or 42.86% down from last year. Uh, all other calls, there was one. I have no idea what that is because it could be a thousand different things, and it could be any of us deputies as we all take our turns. Uh, disorderly conducts, there were zero. Drug offenses, there was one. Uh, no DUIs, no family offenses, oh, okay. no forgeries, okay. one fraud, no, no frauds compared to the one from last year. Okay, just see yes. No liquor law violations, no runaways, no sex offenses. There was one simple assault compared to pre last year, which that is down 66.67%. Zero for stolen property. There was one trespasser compared to two last year. There were four sets of vandalism. Uh, hopefully, I think uh, if we've slowed that down a little bit. Um, zero weapons complaints, and um, all other, which again could be a thousand different things, and non-reportable offenses, there are nine of them. Um, that brings a total to the, the total crime rate is down 36.84% compared to last year. Any questions? I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. One, who's your friend? Uh, that is Deputy Quinn. Hi. Uh, he is a reserve with us, and he rides around with me. <coughs> Uh, the other one is you have this amazing assortment of masks that I see you wear when you're out and about. My favorite is one with the unicorn on it. <laughs> Why are you not wearing it? Uh, we are no longer allowed to wear those for uniformity. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. it's black, white, or the N95 surgical type. I'm really sorry to hear that. Would want to allow any self expression. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, there, there's actually been a lot of discussion about your masks in the community. I'm not going to lie. Yes. They're, uh, they're quite the draw. They're very popular. Yeah. 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 They're, 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 they're the new fashion statement. <laughs> yes. That's what they are. Yeah. And I, I think when I'm dealing with young people, it's better. This to me seems a little. They seem, forward. They seem less cold. I'm not yes. going to lie. They, they yeah. make you human. And yeah. I, I appreciate that. So I'm sorry <laughs> that you can't wear those anymore. I'm sorry. I wish I could. So I did, I did have a question about the non-reportable offenses. Is that like the non-emergency calls? So no, non-reportable offenses are going to be here. Non-reportable offenses are going to be things that they're not a crime. So we're, we're taking a report because it's, well, let's say it's somebody that's having some mental health stuff going on. They're, they're in crisis. It's, they're not committing any crimes. They're really not committing any violations. It was just something that we came upon. Okay. Um, but it needs to be documented and then we'll send it to mental health. Um, it's just to keep that paper trail for things like that. Okay. Just so it's, it's just for clarification purposes. Mm -hmm. yep. Double check that. Nope. And I'm any other, I'm good with answering all those. <laughs> okay. Do you, have you had any luck with our $250 reward? Has anybody come to you guys and um, have you gotten any information out of it? I've had one that I'm working on that could be legit. Oh. Cool. Um, there's a couple that are people that are 
trying to get money, uh -huh. uh, but they're not giving me anything that's right. going anywhere. Okay. Um, they think they are, but I've got one that I'm working right now. And um, I've got it kind of narrowed down, so we're kind of getting there. But I have noticed that I haven't seen anything new. Um, I've got no more calls on it, so maybe just the fact with that happening mm -hmm. has made them realize, oh no, uh, people are going to tell on me because $250 is a lot of money to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it'll stem it down a little bit. Awesome. Well, congratulations on your numbers. Yep. Fantastic. It helped yep. the community. Yep. Thank you. Um, the only thing, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your showing up and coming to talk to us. Whenever I can. It's a wonderful day. Um, I just have one statement here. We've got a... Um, Thanks, Terry. Yep. Roberta Weeks, who usually comes in and gives us a um, report on the Lafayette Citizens Watch. She's evidently, because of the COVID, stuck in um, Australia. So once she gets back, she'll probably come and, and update us and keep us going on that portion of it, too. So anyway, that's why she hasn't been here. I was surprised that she hadn't been there, and I just found out this last week that she's stuck in Australia. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's not, not a bad place to be stuck in, though. <laughs> Okay, anybody else on the sheriff report? Was the email going to be read in that portion? Uh, that was it right there. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you were going to read the email no. out loud no. for public purposes or whatnot. No. Okay. Um, okay, let's approve the minutes. We need approval of the minutes of July 9th. The July City Council meeting, July 9th. I got a couple little grammatical things. Okay. okay on page two of six, item number eight, first sentence, Travis Johnson commented that Deputy McMahon does a fantastic, I think there should be the word job in returning phone calls. Okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah, the next paragraph. The last sentence uh, where it says, but acknowledged that each are responsible for their own sale, but acknowledge just needs a D on the end of it. And one more on page four of six. I just had a question about the very last line there uh, under department reports. It just says the McMinnville Library Bookmobile at Joel Perkins Park in July and August. I don't Something like will be. I'm not sure what that means. But it's, uh, I think it, I think that bookmobile it should say will be in Joel Perkins Park in July and August. Okay, that would make more sense. Okay, because I think that that's what they announced last meeting. Yeah, and we had it in our newsletter the date for the August. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. And if I can have a motion, is that it? Yep. Okay. Anybody else? If I can have a motion with those um, changes, that would be great. Motion to approve city council meeting minutes from July 9th, 2020 with noted changes. Second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, any additions or deletions from the agenda? Uh, Your Honor, I don't have any other than, you know, we've got certain people, consultants coming in at different times. and Well, they're set up here under B and H, so we've got the action items. Right. If you need to switch things to make those times that's all understood well, yeah okay i'll keep an eye on that to make sure that we move along quite nicely okay, okay um any um citizen input on non-agenda items hillary um hillary mountainson 915 grant street i just wanted to present to the city my daughter raised money for the water bill the water uh, bill. relief bill uh for the i had mentioned to you guys that we were doing a big community garage sale we had about 25 at least 
on it. And so we commanded, but we had maps for everyone. So we took advantage of the fact that everyone would be swinging by ours. And so she sold our by donation, uh, accepted um, doing a lemonade stand of COVID proof, single bottles, single packet of mixes. It was really good. So she decided on her own after hearing some of us talk that she wanted to raise money for the water relief fund. So she raised $32. Oh, I no. I that to the city on her okay. behalf. Yeah. And I know I could have brought it to the office, but she's home watching on TV. So. Well, she's watching the Blazers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, well, and that would be for the donation program. That's all. Yes, yeah, yes, okay. All right. Right, right on. Uh, very cool. Excellent. That means we're, we're starting to amass some good amount of money on that program. Okay. Uh, Anything? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Go ahead. Um, I want to make sure everyone's done. Greg Villard, PO Box 1077. I actually had a list, you know, like I usually do, uh, but uh, Preston um, offered to um, all of us to talk to him about things, so I'm not going to go through my list. I'll always ask Preston those directly. Um, I did want to comment on the the water tie, the uh, inner tie that we have, and uh, if you can answer my question, uh, I, re I realize that there's a thousand dollar minimum expectation whether, you know, if we don't meet this, you know, that's the minimum. Mm -hmm. And I think we we're almost at 1200 um, this last, so it wasn't a thousand, it was $1,197. So, and I know we're flushing the system and we're doing all of that. So I'm just curious, is that when we're not drawing, is that the expected bill is about around twelve hundred dollars? No. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to as far as the twelve hundred, but uh, are you talking about the fact that it says we have to draw at least or pay at least a thousand dollars a month? I didn't write the transaction number, but it's it's on tonight's sheet on um, the budget and oh. that's part of the invoice for the transactions on the back. And that total was Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what that was. Let I'll, me answer your question. question okay, sure, sure. That'd be yeah, fine. Okay. Uh, if, yeah. if you would get with Preston with a lot of these these questions sure. and stuff like that before, because he's more than happy to answer that, then we don't have to spend so much time during council. Absolutely. And there are times where I would like it on the record. That's fine. And, and um, Dollar General, can you give us an update on that? Any, any news on sure. that? And other than that, that would be nice for the folks that are watching and listening and that don't read the agenda or the packets. Sure. Uh, you would like me to do that, Your Honor? Uh, sure. Uh, so real fast on the on the water, Mac Water and Light. Uh, uh, we did get our first bill for usage in July. Uh, and and it, you might have noted in the water purchase agreement it's our obligation to, to keep enough water flowing. So it's right. It, uh, and, uh, and so uh, a minimum a thousand a month, we'll, we'll do that. No problem. And take care of our expenses with Mac and give us enough water. But that really doesn't uh, come into play until winter months because the rest of the time of the year, six to eight months a year, we're pulling water. We are. Right. The only time we're going to be doing minimums might be, in the winter time, when we got a, a lot coming from our spring, so uh, uh, so it's designed to have a jockey pump there that can run when when the system's been off for so many hours. Uh, uh, but uh, it's just not going to come into play until the winter months. Uh, so um, and all of that, all of that stuff eventually will be automatic because of the fact that. They're working on the computer systems and the laptop to control it and stuff like that. And all of that will be, it'll basically run itself. Right. So we won't have, other than just monitoring it, we won't have to do anything. Right now, I believe that they're running it just during the day so that the people that are in charge of it are here on site. So if something happens, they, they can be there and, and answer a problem or something. And then they switch it off at night and go back to the date and stuff. So that that's what they're doing right now. But, but like I said, once the um, once the electronics is all done and hooked up, it'll it'll just you won't have to do anything. 
It'll turn off the pumps and turn them on when they're supposed to, or turn everything. Right. Uh, uh, automated systems being developed. Yeah, right. Uh, so I'll look to him for me. Oh, on the Dollar General, uh, uh, the building plans have been submitted uh, and uh, they're in plan review at the Newark, who uh, city of Newark does our building official inspection uh, and plan review services. Is, is that different than a site plan? Or the same thing? Because I think you said that last month. So there's been no change. Uh, you know, the first stage in doing any kind of commercial construction is a site plan. That's a staff review that makes sure it complies with all uh, public work standards. Uh, the, anything they're planning doesn't, anything that they're wanting to construct doesn't conflict with standards. So it's something would have to go to a planning commission or something. So that was all completed last month. They submitted all their building plans and now that's under plan review. Uh, once they get that back, they pay their fees, everything, then they can go start building. And, and you'll, you'll, my yeah, guess is. There won't be any building done until after November. Sure. Oh, oh, they're waiting until November? Okay. Yeah. At least until mid November. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank uh, you. Appreciate it. You bet. Okay. Anything else, guys, before I move on? What happened to Joseph? Where did he go? Uh, unfortunately, his uh, one of his kids fell down and, and he had to leave. Okay. So he said sorry, but uh, okay. No, at least he was here. That's he fine. is, and, <laughs> and and he's very interested. Yes. Um, we had a We had an application for someone on the budget committee, Joseph Cars Carswell, who just was here, and Preston talked to him at length, and I talked to him at length. So I would like to. Um, Submit him as a nomination for one of the vacancies for the budget committee. So, unfortunately, he, I asked him to be here so he could ask him questions, but he's not. He's been, um, he works for a bank, Northwest Bank. So, he's not, um, he's got accounting and he's got dollar figures and stuff like that experience so i think he has a good experience and he'll work well nicely he was a very personal guy when i talked to him on the phone um he's really excited about getting involved with the city and going forward and stuff like that so um i'm all for him it's kind of a nice story really uh he had applied to get a, a street closure for uh fourth of july mm -hmm. And we had talked about it, and then he waited about a month, and on July 2nd, he said, hey, God, you know, here's my thing and, and everything, and I got it all done and approved the next day. Good. He was so impressed. He said, God, that was, that was unbelievable. I was, uh, so, well, that's what we try to do, you know, and we can. But, yeah, we asked for 30 days for all the sign-offs, but we had it done, you know. He says, you know, I, I just, uh, uh, I'm at a point. In my life, I want to. I want to give back. I want to spend more time. And he says, "How do I do that?" I says, "Well, apply. Apply to be on a committee." And then you took it from there, Your Honor, and talked to him. And yeah, I, I just I think he, he seems like a real calm and stable guy, and, and I think he'll work real nice with the rest of the people on the budget committee because we do have two vacancies, and this will fill one of them. So we're still looking. If anybody has someone else they want to run in, please. Um, Get him to us because we need another person. So, so what I need is a nomination. Was he choosing the two-year slot or the three-year slot? That's up to you, Council. I think we'll just give him the three-year slot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's really interested. We might we might as well grab him and keep him. <laughs> Okay, I move to appoint Joseph Carswell to the Lafayette Budget Committee for a term of three years. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Joseph, you're here. You're all, you're with us now. <laughs> Congratulations for three years. <laughs> three years. And and the timing's kind of important because if things go the way they might tonight, we're gonna to be convening the budget committee next month. And so uh, his timing to come in it was perfect, and so hopefully that's the way it goes tonight. We're a little bit early. Is um, by any chance is Elaine Howard out there, or is she not here yet? Could be. 
Uh, Elaine Howard is going to give us a presentation on the feasibility study for an urban renewal history for the downtown area. That's the next step. Since we've got the fire station, we've got the inner tie. The next thing is an urban renewal district, and that will um, help fund a lot of a lot of stuff that we need to do within the city. Streets, the sidewalks, you know, this type of stuff. You know, also um, some maybe some building improvements and stuff like that. It just depends on how the urban renewal is set up. Hey, Jeremy, do you mind going there and we'll have a... Hey, man. Is, is Scott... He is not coming. Okay. I'm going to... Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, call so you can listen. Oh, you bet. He can stream the meeting and everything if he wants. Yeah, I think uh, well, while Elaine's getting set up, let me uh, introduce uh, her and... Uh, uh, Elaine Howard, our uh, consultant here, that's uh, going to kind of walk us through urban renewal, and and I've I've worked with Elaine on at least one project. Now uh, we implemented a urban renewal in Wood Village, uh, but it just seems like we've worked again on somewhere else over the years. Uh, but Elaine's uh, 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 very well known. In, doing urban renewal feasibility studies and implementation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real neat planning niche. Very, very few, few consultants in Oregon do that specifically. There's a number of firms that do it, but if you, unless you're willing to pay double or more, we don't need a firm, we just need a link. She'll do a fabulous job, I know she will. Uh, uh, and 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 this this proposal tonight is uh, uh, budgeted. We went through the budget committee. We discussed it very briefly at the budget committee. Uh, we probably talked about it a few times with council about urban renewal and things like that in terms of revitalizing downtown. Uh, and and this proposal before you tonight is is to do a feasibility study. It's not to implement urban renewal. It's to do the study. So once the study's done, then you decide whether you want to implement it the following fiscal year. So uh, so you're you're not voting on a district tonight. You do it uh, uh, after the study. So, so um, I've implemented uh, urban rural districts. I've been urban rural director. I've, uh, and I think urban renewal is a wonderful tool to revitalize your downtown if you do it right. And we have the conditions here in Lafayette where this can be a wonderful thing for our downtown. Even Terry Lucic says, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. You know, after years of indoctrination from special districts, I finally Broke them down to understand that this can be a good thing for the community. Thank you, Terry. Uh, he's our fire chief, Terry Lucic. Uh, uh, like so, uh, fire station, it looks like. It is, yes, yes. Uh, uh, it was so nice to visit with Elaine and bring her up to speed on how far the community's come over the last uh, decade and the facilities and the community support. And it's just a great time for urban renewal. The only thing that just doesn't fall into place is having a core group of downtown folks that can be advocates, that can be, you know, help us with the plan and all that stuff. And, and because of the pandemic, we just have not been able to get that together. Uh, there's money in there for a consultant to help facilitate that, get them their 501c3 and everything. But so uh, that's not going to be there. That doesn't mean we can't reach out, you know, to folks. But uh, uh, with that, uh, Elaine, you want to kind of walk us through. And there's a lot of slides here. I know you're not going to address all of them. You're going to highlight that. Uh, we got a huge agenda tonight. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Your Honor, your okay. your so can you hear me with this on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Preston asked that I put this in a PDF for you, so I'll just go page by page and tell you when to turn. Um, so, the first page that says the roadmap, um, 
We'll go through the terminology. We'll talk about why communities use urban renewal. Um, we'll just talk about really what urban renewal is, do a little 101, and then we have project examples. So I go through this pretty quickly. If you want me to slow down or ask questions, feel free to raise your hand. And in fact, I do about, my firm does about 90% of the urban renewal work in all of Oregon. So even though there are other large firms that maybe do one project here or there, we do the bulk of it. And that is all our firm does is urban renewal work across the state. Awesome. So on the page that says terminology, um, UR means urban renewal. That's the statutory reference in Oregon. URA is an urban renewal area. URD is an urban renewal district. They're the same thing. Cities call them one or both. CIF is tax increment funds or tax increment financing. And then we'll talk about what that means. MI is maximum indebtedness. When you establish an urban renewal area, you have to establish a maximum indebtedness. That is the curtailing feature of urban renewal. It is the total amount of money that you may spend in that area over the lifetime of the area. So you set that at the point that you actually adopt an urban renewal plan. And then AV is assessed value. Next page. So in Oregon, why do cities choose to use urban renewal? Um, many cities come to us similar to you, or they have a downtown area that needs improvements. Maybe they need storefront grants, maybe there's infrastructure, maybe they need incentives for businesses. There are things that they want to happen within their city that they don't have funds in their regular city general fund budget to do. If you establish an urban renewal area, an urban renewal plan, it is the financing source to implement those projects that you want to do in your city. Um, so it provides an additional toolbox, an additional tool in your toolbox for your city to use in doing things to make your city uh, work better. The next slide is, uh, this is actually works much nicer on a PowerPoint because it's a little, little animation that Scott and my office prepared. But um, on the first slide, you can see just the animation that property tax revenues in Oregon go straight to regular taxing jurisdictions. On the next slide, you can see those property taxes increase for one or two different reasons. The 3% increase allowed due to measures 5, 47, and 50 and substantial rehab or new construction. Those are the only reasons uh, property taxes increase. And typically all of that increase in assessed value taxes off that go to the different taxing districts. If you have an urban renewal area in your city, so that's the third of this little series that shows that urban renewal area. Um, so yes, there you are, that's the correct one. If you form an urban renewal area, the assessed value at the time that that area is formed is what's called frozen. That doesn't mean the property taxes are frozen. The property taxes continue going up just like everybody's property taxes. What it means is all of the taxing districts, including the city, continue getting their property taxes off of the value at that property at the time the urban renewal area is established. Any increase in value within that urban renewal area during the length of the urban renewal, renewal plan goes to the urban renewal agency. So that increased value typically would have gone <coughs> to the city, to the county, to the fire district, to the school district. Instead, it goes to the urban renewal agency to do projects and programs within the urban renewal area. Next slide. Or page, sorry. Um, so it's an economic development tool used widely across the state of Oregon. It's unique in that it has financing um, that goes with the plan that has specific projects that you're allowed to do. It addresses what's called blighting conditions. Blight is a prerequisite of establishing an urban renewal area. The statute actually defines what blight is. And you have to have at least one of those circumstances of blight within your community, within your urban renewal area to form that area. We certainly do. 
And <laughs> on the next page, it shows. Can I ask a question? You may. It says here unique and that is a financing tool. Does that mean it's a financing tool if a business needs a loan? that the urban renewal can make a loan to that for either improvements or anything that is supposed to, what the, what the urban renewal wants to have done? Right. Okay. Um, if you adopt a plan, you adopt certain projects. Mm -hmm. In an area that has a downtown like you do, mm -hmm. almost always there is a project called storefront improvement loans. Okay. And so that, you set up your own loan guidelines, but that allows a business to come to you and get a loan or a grant to improve usually the facade of their building. Um, you can also use Urban Renewal to provide improvements um, to the interior, but you want to make sure there are improvements that stick with the building and not with the business. Right. So if the business goes out of business, you haven't lost your investment. So if you put a new furnace in, it sticks with the building, right? You put a new roof on, it sticks with the building. So, yeah. Um, and then we're now on the map of urban renewal cities, and we won't spend long on that. It's just I put that in so that people can see it's widely used um, across the state. In Yamiel County, there are a number of localities. Not McBinville has an urban renewal area. Carlton does, Dundee does. I'm working with Newburgh right now on the potential of establishing one. Um, so it, it's something widely used by cities as a tool for their community. In McMinnville, was the Alpine Street part yes. of the Yeah. Yep. And I uh, helped them write that plan. And so their plan is the downtown area, and then that Alpine Street area um, adjoins that urban renewal area to make both of them improve together. Yeah. So yes, those beautiful Alpine improvements were funded through the urban renewal area. Yeah. So an urban renewal area functions off of an income source, and that is the property taxes off the increased assessed value within the area. It has expenses, so you do an annual budget if you have an area, just like you do an annual city budget to identify how you're going to spend your money and it has that spending limit, the maximum indebtedness, that lasts over the life of the plan. Uh, next page is a little graph, a chart, and that just shows you, sometimes people understand this better with a, a visual, like the chart. Uh, along the bottom, it shows you that frozen base assessed value, so that's the assessed value of an urban renewal area at the time it's adopted. And again, all the different property taxing jurisdictions will continue getting their taxes off of that. And then it shows that increment that goes up over time. So the thing to understand about urban renewal is uh, it lasts a long time because it, come, it starts out very slowly. It starts out with only that 3% increase on the year. assessed value within your area. So the beginning years are really small, and until you put enough money aside to actually have enough money to actually do projects. Unless there's some construction that might happen within your urban renewal area, that at the point it comes on the assess the assessor's values, that will help jumpstart an urban renewal area. But typically it's just that 3% increase. So that's why that gap goes up slowly. That's why urban renewal areas last between 20 and 30 years, typically, across the state. Who controls the urban That's a good question. If you um, decide to move ahead, and if you do a feasibility study and you like the results of that, you then create what's called an urban renewal agency. Mm -hmm. So it is a body, like the city council is a body, mm -hmm. um, the members of that agency are appointed by the city council. In most cities, they are the city council. So the city council just wears a different hat. They, uh, I had a meeting last night with Lebanon. This is a city council meeting. In the middle of the meeting, they adjourned the city council meeting temporarily, opened the urban renewal agency meeting, did the business for that suspended the agency meeting and then started back up the city council. So how many, how many of the people that you deal with have it within this or have a separate agency? Um, What's the percentage? I, 
I don't know for sure. The vast majority, I, I'd say over 80%, mm -hmm. the Urban Renewal Agency is the city council. Okay. There are only a few who add, the city of Sandy adds the fire chief to the Urban Renewal Agency. The city of the Dalles has a member of each taxing district um, as the agency. Mm -hmm. um, so it, uh, but the vast majority have the city council themselves be the urban renewal agency. Thank you. The, the reason that works well in my mind is what the urban renewal agency does is spend money. People in your community want to know who to talk to if money's being spent. Mm -hmm. And if they don't like it, they want to know who to vote for and who not to vote for, right? <laughs> If it's just an appointed board, they don't have control over that. If it's the mayor and city council, they do have more of a direct line of input. And I think in small communities, especially, it works better to have the city council. <laughs> On the next page, there's a pie chart. Um, this just helps to understand we made this presentation at the League of Oregon Cities a couple of years ago in a city. Um, Councilman came up afterwards and he said, well, why don't we just allocate our own taxes from that area to the urban renewal area and not worry about taking everybody else's taxes? And I said, well, you can, you can decide to do that. Typically, the city tax rate is about 30% of your total tax rate. So if you only allocate your city funds, you're allocating one third of the amount of money if you establish an urban renewal area, that you get to do projects. So establishing the urban renewal area gives you that increased taxes for that whole tax rate, the county, the schools, the community college, for, for everybody. So it, it allows you to leverage your city funds with the tax rates from those other jurisdictions. Uh, also, Elaine, if I could jump in. Uh, through urban renewal, you traditionally fund a lot of other things that you normally wouldn't to benefit private development of properties. And, you know, so, so the urban renewal tool is a way to have everybody buy in that you're going to do this to help businesses, help commingle uh, uh, co properties for commercial development and things that you traditionally wouldn't do with just your general fund taxes. So it can be done. But you don't have the amount, and then it's this is a non-traditional uh, approach to do it on your own. Yeah, but this is completely separate from the general fund, which is, is. because the general fund is controlled by other things. Mm -hmm. Where this is different, correct? And that's, that's and that's what's the most important thing. That is that is that is another re reason why that's important to do it that way. You got a plan. You, everybody's bought into it, and uh, and you you typically would not do those things without the urban renewal district. And the reason other taxing districts go along with it is if your urban renewal area is managed well, you're able to increase those assessed values. So at the end of the time that urban renewal is in effect, there those values are higher than what they would have been if you didn't have urban renewal. So all the taxing districts will then get more money than they would have if you didn't have an urban renewal area. When you're saying other taxing districts, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the county. Okay. The school all district. Them. The Education Service District, the 4 H and Extension, um, all, the, all of your different taxing jurisdictions. Yeah. So, this 30 years later. 20, 20 25, 30, 30 depending later. on the time frame. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Um, schools and Education Service Districts are okay, handled I differently. Sure I, I just wanted to make sure that I understood when you said other taxing yeah. districts, what yeah. you were talking about. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it's also important to know that schools and education service districts are not directly impacted by urban renewal. They are funded through the state school fund on a per pupil basis. So urban renewal takes money from the private property taxes that go into the state school fund, but the state school fund is comprised of income tax revenues, general fund revenues, lottery fund revenues, um, federal fund revenues. So urban renewal anywhere in Oregon impacts that state school fund. And so what we say is the impact of urban renewal is indirect on the funding of schools because it funds what goes in there, but the state through the legislature can allocate money from other sources 
to fill the state school fund. And so how does bonds work? Bonds are not impacted by urban renewal at all. Okay, so if we put in another bond for like a city camp, city high, city, like a, let's say, just an example, a city hall, we put in another bond, it's still going to, the urban renewal district is still going to have to pay that portion. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, the, so technically speaking, the tax is just not frozen. It, it's frozen for most things, but certain exceptions. It, and and the difference is taxes aren't frozen. Just this imaginary concept of the value of that property at the time it's adopted yes, is right. frozen. So yes, if you passed a bond for a new city hall, mm -hmm. all of those property taxpayers would still pay that amount, whether or not they're in the urban renewal area or not, okay. they would still pay their amount towards that bond. Urban renewal would not take that. Urban renewal doesn't cause that to change at all. Okay. Um, these next three slides, and how are we doing on time? You've got, you, you've got 15 more minutes. Okay. The next three slides go together and, and they are to illustrate two different facts. One is that property taxes do not go up on individuals' properties because of urban renewal. Urban renewal is a division of taxes they already pay. So the first page with the two lines on it just shows a hypothetical property tax bill with a... Um, a tax rate of 10.8. Um, the next slide shows if you didn't have an urban renewal area and that property value went up by 3% to 103,000 instead of 100,000, that that property tax bill goes up by 3%. And then the next slide with four columns shows that if that property were in the urban renewal area and it went in when it was valued at $100,000, that increase of $32.41, which is highlighted there, will go towards the urban renewal agency instead of to all the different taxing districts. But if you look at the bottom line, the property taxes that that property tax payer would pay is the same with or without an urban renewal area. So it's important for people to understand it does not increase property tax rates for people. It does not increase their property tax bill. The impact of urban renewal is on other taxing districts, including the city itself. Basically what it is, is it just determines where the property tax amount of money goes That's versus correct. where it went before. That's is correct. What you're saying. Everything else works the same. That's correct. And if you have an urban renewal area for... 25 years and that urban renewal area terminates, those property taxes don't go down. Mm -hmm. That money just then uh, being reallocated to all of the different taxing districts. What is the average years that a urban renewal goes? A 20-year district is really the minimum because mm -hmm. everything goes slowly and it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, in, in towns your size, 25 years is pretty typical. Um, 30 years for smaller towns a lot of times feels too long. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger towns who have you know huge infrastructure projects, it, it could take 30 years to get enough money to do those huge infrastructure projects. Sure. Um, but typically in, in smaller sites communities like yours, it's a 25 year plan. Okay, thank you. So the next page just reiterates um, what I've repeated. So I'm, I'm not going to go over that again, just in, in terms of making sure you have time for other questions and we can look at some of the examples. The next set of slides where it says urban renewal utopia are, are basically slides to understand that if you adopt an urban renewal area, every property tax bill in the city would have urban renewal on their property tax bill, not just those properties within the urban renewal area. And that is because the assessor has to go through a two-stage process because of measures 5, 47, and 50 in collecting the money and then uh, figuring, figuring out how much money has to be collected and then collecting the money. 
So the last set of slides we just went through, for every property within the urban renewal area, the assessor will calculate how much increase in value there's been since it was adopted and what the taxes are off of that. If there are 100 houses in the urban renewal area, the assessor will do that for that 100 houses and come up with a figure. And let's say in, in our little hypothetical area here, um, it shows that each one of these houses is valued at $100,000. We know that's not always true, but for the sake of this graphic, it works well. Formed an urban renewal area. You look at the third slide of those and it shows that the growth is 3%. So the assessor then has to figure out $450 worth of money that goes to the urban renewal area. When you look at the next slide that is titled distribution, one would think logically that that money comes from the houses in the urban renewal area. And on the next slide of distribution where we have the big red X that goes through that, we do that so that visually you can remember in the future when somebody asks you and you can say, no, I can remember that big red X. It doesn't just come from those. It, however, it gets allocated proportionally to every property tax bill in the city. And again, that's due to measures 547 and 50 and the property tax limitations um, and a lawsuit of Shilohans versus the city of Portland. So it, that, that determined how that allocation is made through the assessor's office. And, and people will never understand that. Um, and it's something if you decide to go ahead, we'll want to make sure you all understand because you will get that question. The question that I have is that one, let's say that we do a feasibility study and it's something that you want, we want to go through. Okay, now do you have to establish every project at the time it begins and you can't add something after the fact? You, you may add later. Um, the statute says that you have to both establish financial feasibility and establish what projects you're going to do right. at the time you adopt the plan. We all know that if the plan is 25 years long, that's maybe going to change over time. And right. so there's a process within the plan for what are called minor amendments to the plan. And that is changing your projects. So the Urban Renewal Agency has the ability over the life of the plan to change the projects. Projects by statute really have to be projects that are capital projects. So you can't use it for funding fire, fire salaries, right? Right, I understand. You can fund it for bricks and mortar. Right. And the city can take an amount that's reasonable for administration of the urban renewal area. So over time, you'll be able to change projects, but you still have to change them within those guidelines of bricks and mortar types of projects. Okay. So, so if you've got a new business and he wanted to do something new with this building, it's a new project that can be added and, and financed at that time. It, because... It, because it's something new, right? So you can add as long as it's brick and mortar. Yeah, and, and typically there's a category in a plan called storefront loans. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say which buildings are going to get those. Or you can just allocate you, that. You money. can just have the category of storefront loans. Okay. You can also have a category of redevelopment assistance that mm -hmm. says you're you're eligible to do different kinds of activities under that big category. And again, again you don't like have streets, to say like streets and. Um, Sidewalks and streets and sidewalks, or participating with a developer, maybe paying for their frontage improvements because that's something. Uh, it, it's a business you really want to happen in your town. They financially can't make it happen, mm -hmm. um, but they would if they could get some assistance. And so you say, well, if we'll if we can do your frontage improvements, does that make your project feasible? And and by participating with them, you're able to get a project built that wouldn't have been built if you weren't able to assist them. So the Urban Renewal District has the ability to loan and also to pay for yes. stuff. Yes. We're, we're, not, we're not obligated to loan and get the money back. It's just so we can do either way. That's correct. Okay. So you can do streetscape improvements on your own, spend your own money. You can put in street trees. You can put in benches. You can put in... Um, 
you know, a, a, a pocket park, any of those things are typical types of urban renewal projects or it's a straight expenditure from the urban renewal agency to complete a project within your urban renewal area. How large usually is an urban renewal district? Uh, for a city your size, your district may not be more than 25% of your total city acreage. Okay, so we are, what, what, where we're at a uh, square mile? So we well, can yes. do a quarter mile? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and typically when you're doing a feasibility study, you're looking at really three things. You're looking at what a potential boundary might be. So where might you want to do projects? what kinds of projects those would be. You, you look at what are the projects that are going to make that area improve just on a high level. You don't you know, cost them all out or anything. You look at your existing plans or input from the community. And then you do a financial feasibility and say, if these are the properties within the urban renewal area, how much money will we raise over time to be able to do projects? And we come back and give you that information, and then you decide whether, given that amount of capacity, you think it's worth it to do an urban renewal area or not. Could you establish an urban renewal area, and then when you had finished, let's say, half of it, you could pick up another half? You cannot. You cannot. So um, you're stuck with what you have. You, you may add up to 20% of your original acreage. So if you, let's say you put in 40 acres, mm -hmm. um, you could add up to 20%. So an additional eight acres you could add to that area. Okay. If you take any acres out, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the statute's written specifically that you... Because otherwise your urban renewal area ends up moving all over your downtown and yeah. your taxing districts okay. never know... What, what's happening. So it, it gives some certainty to the different taxing districts about where is your plan area, what are you wanting to do, how long is it going to be? Well, we have, the reason that I was asking is because we have some property out here on the other side that is, you know, it's not developed yet. It's about the only development. So that if, you know, we created an urban growth boundary, we may want to add some of that to the urban growth boundary but we wouldn't do it now because it's not developed. Well, you, you, now is actually the right time to do it but so that when it gets developed, you are able to <coughs> use the increment off of that, that new assessed value, mm -hmm. all of the taxes off of that will be money that you can use to do projects within your area. It has to be within the urban growth boundary. It has to be within your urban growth boundary, not your city limits, right. but within your urban growth right. boundary. You were talking. If it's, it is. It is. Okay. if it's outside of your city limits, no, it's not. It's it's within your city limits. Yeah. Then it, it is actually an ideal kind of property to put in because the growth off of that gives you the taxes that will fuel, and you may be able to figure out a way to work with a developer to make that property actually develop faster. Because you might you, you might have some funds or ability through your urban renewal area to give incentives to make that development happen more quickly. Can an urban renewal area be a residential area, or yes. does it, so it doesn't have to be just commercial? It can be residential. Yes, and in Wilsonville, uh, one whole area is the Ville of Bois neighborhood. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's simply a residential neighborhood that was farmland. Zone residential, Wilsonville had not nearly much enough housing for the employment that they had. And so they created an urban renewal area to create housing for their city. So you could also use it to say, improve some rundown parts of town. So yes. it actually might benefit to have some residential sections yeah. of our town included. Don't in you have some good examples of that? Yeah. That, well, that, yeah, I was just addressing Mayor Sprouse. No, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, we already know about, I mean, yeah. up to third you know, or fourth and, and down there. I mean, those areas are right. residential. I'm talking about the property that's yeah. out there, depending on how, if, and when it ever comes into the city. If it comes in residential, could we still use it for that? Yeah. That's why yeah. I was and you're referring to the gray area on our zoning map that's right. currently industrial, but right. but that's exactly what we need. 
that's what I'm talking about. It's, right now it's industrial. It may not stay that way. Right. You know, it depends on what happens in the next 25 years. And if that's the case, if we bring it in as residential or maybe a portion of a commercial and residential, can we still put it within that district? Right. Yeah. So urban renewal doesn't change the zoning. So whatever, if you bring it in now and it's owned industrial, that's fine. And in, in the future, somebody wants to develop it and they do the zone change. Urban renewal has nothing to do with any of that. Mm -hmm. So you know that it, it's it's a whole separate thing that's just based on assessed values of properties. What type of improvements did Wilsonville use their urban renewal money for in that development? In that area, they put in um, streets, water, you know, the basic infrastructure. They helped fund the basic infrastructure mm -hmm. that allowed the housing development plan. They also actually purchased a site and gave it to the school district because they had to build an entire new school um, to serve the, the new residents. So, uh, in the interest of time, let's just go to the project's examples and we'll flip through those really quickly. So the first one is Sisters, and that just shows some beautiful streetscapes that was done. I was only funded in part through urban renewal, but I include it because it is a very typical kind of project that's done in urban renewal. Um, it is an eligible project, and they did a great job in Sisters. Uh, the next slide is McMinnville, and that does show the area that you were talking about. That's adjacent the to the area, down, yeah. you know, the Alpine area, the improvements that they put in there. The next two slides, I think, are those. Yeah. Um, the, the next one is Estacada, and that streetscape that they put in in their downtown. Um, it's a, a little lower cost than the sister street was, but it is still beautiful and has done a really nice job of encouraging businesses to the downtown. Um, I put in some arches because cities have... Uh, Put in arches to help delineate. You know, you're in our city now, so you can see Lincoln City and Troutdale arches there. Um, this signage, the Pendleton signage, is uh, really nice. All of those were done through the Urban Renewal Program. Um, business signage, so having really nice business signage to show off your businesses uh, is a good use of Urban Renewal. Uh, the next slide. It just shows another streetscape. Um, then we have the Astoria Fort George Brewery. So this was a dilapidated building uh, in Astoria, vacant, uh, knocked out windows. And a uh, developer, this, uh, Fort George Brewery, came to the Urban Renewal Agency. They got a grant and a loan. They partnered that with a small business association loan and you know, other developer equity and develops the Port George Brewery, which now delivers beer all over the Western United States. So it was really a, a great project. Um, the next page is the Devil Old Dragon and Sandy. Sandy established just a whole design theme to their downtown, um, the, the kind of Western village with the, um, a lot of use of wood and arches and um, awnings. They've done a terrific job in their city of implementing that on the small businesses and any new businesses. Um, I went through last weekend and a Dutch Brothers coffee, you know how they always just look like the little Dutch Brothers? Well, they, they just developed in Sandy and they use this same mountain theme. And it looks great. It fits in with the city. It, it really ties in with the thing that they're trying to do. Um, down at, so we have the Sandy Glass building, just another rehab, storefront rehab, the Garden of Searching Ways in Astoria, which is a park. Um, but it was done with the intent of bringing tourists to Astoria. And then there are two uh, pictures of uh, La Grand is focusing their urban renewal area on business loans. So trying to get new businesses to establish or existing businesses to expand. So they are, that, that is the focus of their urban renewal area right now. They've done some streetscape work. They did some other infrastructure work. They, they're now just concentrating on this small business development. 
And we're almost at the end of our time. So if anybody have any specific questions? Doug? Nope. Kayla? Not at the moment. I'm sorry? Not at the moment. Yeah. Wait. Gina? Not at the moment. Christine? I'm okay. Well, I want to thank you. Oh, Greg, uh, how long would it take to implement an uh, urban renewal? Are we talking three years from now, two years? If, no. If, if everyone said go. Um, it would be the next year. It would be um, budgeted into the next year. So it would be 2021. So we could wrap up these 235 homes in our, into that urban renewal hole, right? No. no. And then, no. Take all that extra assessed value. No, we no. can't do that. No. Uh, right. Uh, no, we wouldn't do that. Right. No. That's well. One thing that was mentioned in the slides is you have to do projects within your district. That's not going to be part of an urban rural district. Yeah. See, we only got a quarter of a uh, you know twenty five percent of the, uh, of that. If we tried to do the downtown and that too, couldn't do it. Yeah. We couldn't do it. Right. So it has the district, you know, you're looking at is 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 the downtown district and maybe some of the area you know, out here into this area here. Okay. I was just trying to think ahead. I appreciate <laughs> the thought though. Because that, that 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 is sometimes what you do is say, is there any new construction that's going to happen that we can capture that will jumpstart our area? Um but you know, if it's not an urban renewal area has to be contiguous. You can tie it through cherry stems, um, but that is one of the interpretations of the statute is that it does have to be tied together. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. And I think what we need to do is discuss whether we want to go and want to have the study. Do we think that it's worthwhile? I think it's worthwhile to have a study down. I think. Especially downtown Lafayette, Third Street, you know, it's it's been needing help for a long time. And I think the city as a whole has been struggling on how to help um, improve. You know, I know we're doing the, the grant program for storefronts. Uh, I'm guessing that's underutilized. Can we'll start in a better direction. Well, it not only allows us to um, change the the scale, the scope of the look of the town. It also allows us to have some money to actively um, entice people to move here, mm -hmm. businesses to come here, and different things of this nature. And that's what that's what Lafayette needs. Is Lafayette needs some way to incentivize businesses to come here to get them through the first maybe three to six months of um, you know of establishment and stuff like that. So you know loans and different things like that. You know another thing is is some of the business some of the buildings need a lot of um, design to them. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, different things like that. We, so we I, model a building into the, a wine tasting room. Exactly. I second yeah. that. Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, we, have, we, have, mm -hmm. we have a couple of really cute buildings that could be, you know, redesigned into something good. And, and we have some houses that could be redesigned into cute little um, antique shops and different things like that. You know, and that type of thing. So I think an urban renewal district will be good for the city. And to be honest with you, it's really the next step. I mean, we've got the inner tide, we've got the fire station. The only the next thing is the downtown area and a and a and a, um, and a um, new um, city hall. Anyway, I I anyway I'm not vote. I don't vote for it, but I agree with it. Yeah. So what I need is a motion, guys. The staff report, I believe, has a motion on it, doesn't it? Yes, there it is. I move to accept Lafayette, Lafayette Urban Renewal Feasibility Scope of Work and direct the city administrator to execute a contract with the Lane Power Consulting LLC. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're ready to go, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be working with us too, and yeah. hopefully, in this silly COVID nineteen times, we'll uh, figure it all out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Elaine. Thank you. See ya. Okay. So next. Okay. The, the water purchase with the 
bought a purchase agreement with McMinnville. This is the third time I think we've signed this baby. Each time estimate, this is the final. That is true. So if we want to talk about it, fine. If we want to just vote on it, move on. It's up to you guys. It's just the it's, well, it's just the same. We've already discussed it. I'm sorry? I said we've already discussed it. There are no changes, significant changes from the last time we discussed this. Okay? Uh, I didn't see anything that stood out. Right. Uh, the agreement doesn't change at all except for this exhibit. That's it. The dollar figures are the only on the exhibit are the only thing right. that changes. And right. we knew from last time we agreed that it would be right. different. Yeah. Right. We finally got a final. Well, it, it should be noted that how wonderful this is. I know. And and all the work that went into it and, and, and ten ten year payback and the original uh, estimate when we first started down this path was you know, we're talking about two point seven million repayment after ten years. Well, it ended up working with Mac Water and Light, negotiating, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking about one point eight million. Uh, and and uh, so it's a lot of good news there. And and to change the project right at the end, uh, to build part of the regional system and to get that done, uh, uh, what we'd said to voters back in May of 2018, to get it done on time and within budget, this is, bi this is big time. This is quite an accolade for the city. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and, and it took all, it's just tremendous amount of work. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're still not out of the woods yet on intertie of everything, but the financial stuff will be done with this action tonight. Yep. And thank you for uh, filling out McMinnville Water and Light and then parenthetically <laughs> putting in WL. That's great because it's in the motion as MWL. So the fact that we've established what that acronym is referring to on the document is right on. It's a good thing. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, can I have a motion? I move to further revise exhibit number two as an amendment to the water purchase agreement with McMinnville Water and Light, identifying current development costs of. One million five hundred twenty-nine thousand three hundred eighty-two dollars, and a ten-year repayment at the adjustable rate of three point three percent. Can I second that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All opposed? Okay. Passed unanimously. Okay, Mr. Recology, you're up. Good time. Dave Larma, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Your name on it. All right. Just jump in, or just jump in. Okay. Uh, so, Mayor Councilors, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, for the record, I'm Dave Larmouth. I'm the rate analyst for Recology, Western Oregon, and my home address is 1350 Northwest Countryside Court in McMinnville. Uh, so thanks for having me uh, tonight. These are uh, unusual times, so probably spend most of my uh, minutes here just, just giving you an update on how we've been handling the current uh, COVID situation and uh, I'm here mostly to take your questions, see if there's anything we can do for you. Um, so starting in about third week of March, most of our customer service and office staff started working from home. Our customer office, our office remains closed to the public, but folks can reach us by phone and by email. We have a bulky item collection available. Uh, some communities have, have paused that. Um, our Current policy is that we can pick up anything that one that one employee can handle. So if if something is big enough that we'd normally send uh, two folks out to get it, we're asking those uh, those people to to wait uh, or be there to help us. Um, at the transfer station and recycling center, employees and customers uh, are wearing masks. Uh, drivers have the, the supplies they need to protect themselves. Uh, for them, we stopped the in-person team meetings. We've staggered their start times, and we have 
uh, limited building access. They have to wear masks is when they're inside or in close quarters. I think they're uh, the there are the real heroes, at least of uh, our company. I just stay at my house and play on the computer, and uh, they're showing up every day uh, in the in the weather in masks. And they, uh, get it. Initially, we had some concerns over the supply chain, uh, everything from fuel and truck parts to uh, gloves and masks. But so far, so good. We've been able to get what we need. Um, when this started, we reached out to staff to let you know that uh, that you can count on us. Uh, we understand uh, the pressure that uh, that uh, this has brought uh, to some of our neighbors, and we want to assure you that if, if there are any residents that are uh, dealing with COVID-related challenges, uh, we'll work with them to ensure that everyone can continue service at home. Um, no one wants trash uh, piling up during a public health crisis. As a result, we have a higher amount than, than is usual for us in our 90 day past due um, accounting uh, bucket, I think is what they call it. But we've uh, committed to, uh, to work with our customers with flexible terms and payment schedules. Really all we're asking them at this point is to, to contact us or answer when we uh, contact them. At, at some point, uh, that that program will will end. I don't know when that will be, but at, at some point, the the uh, folks at corporate office will say that whatever this is is over and we'll go back to normal. Uh, when that happens, I, I I don't know the details, but there will be uh, advance notice. Folks will get letters well in advance saying that it's time to to contact us about making a payment plan. Um, obviously, there have been serious impacts uh, to to our business. Uh, we hope that it's uh, temporary. At the peak of the uh, the stay at home portion of this uh, situation, our commercial uh, lifts, which are for the for our front load cans with the ones with big truck that is like the mm -hmm. big arms that come out and pick it up over the top, which is awesome. They don't let me drive it, but it's <laughs> still awesome. So the, the, the total number of stops was dropped by about 20%. Um, debris box was down as well. Uh, this has come back as more projects uh, have resumed. Uh, construction sites really depended basically site by site whether the project kept going or if they had to take pause. Uh, the uh, overall garbage tons for, for our operations in Amo County uh, were down about 2% year to date. Um, just to, to give you an idea, the debris box tons were down about 30% April through June compared to the same months for the previous year. Commercial front load tons were down 17%. And residential commercial carts, which we combined for, for our purposes, uh, were up 11%. Uh, I don't have the numbers uh, in front of me for recycling and yard room. My understanding those volumes are, are up as well. And uh, it makes sense uh, when you think about it. Most folks are spending more time at home. Yeah. They're shopping in the store for groceries. And so they're bringing home more food and food related garbage and, and recyclables. Um, they're dining out and having takeout. So that's, that's uh, more garbage at home. Uh, they're getting a lot more things delivered, and uh, so we get a, we got more boxes in the recycling and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, they're also uh, at home, so they're looking around their yard and doing landscape <laughs> projects. At one point, the uh, the compost facility uh, had I think like a three week waiting list for for large park deliveries. Folks who just wanted a few uh, a yard here and there, we were fit those in with new smaller trucks. But people that, that had a big project in mind. Some were a little surprised that uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've been working for two months to get bark dust for the parks here because really? we can't because we can't get we can't get it. Can't Is it get that it. special bark we dust? Can't that, it, uh, we can't get enough of it. Hmm. Are you using us or somebody else? I don't know who they're using, but I know that that's a problem that you know Kevin and I and Conrad and Troy have been working on, and we just got some bark dust last week. Mm -hmm. But not not as much as we need, and we've had to go retail for it rather than wholesale. 
Right. So we we aren't a wholesale bark supplier, so we, we couldn't help you with that. But we, it is a retail mill. But we do. Uh, I know there's also some of the parks use uh, special bark dust that's got uh, like rubber crumbs and other things in it. I think it's called soft fall. So yeah, we, that can be hard to get. No, we're looking at hemlock bark dust for our parks. Yeah. Well, if there's anyone we can do to help you with that, uh, I don't I don't work for them directly, but we all are sort of all a little family over there at the office. Okay, uh, where was I? Sorry. So, um, unfortunately, we have sort of a regional and national uh, news media, uh, which can be good for some things, but it can cause confusion and other things. There are some parts of the country where recycling services had to shut down and recycling was was not getting recycled. I just want to assure you and, and our customers that we're collecting it, we're taking it up to the facilities in Portland, they're sorting it, they're marking those materials that are recycling, is getting recycled. Um, some people ask uh, how much is being thrown away and the answer is it's just the material that shouldn't have been in the cart in the first place. Like diapers <laughs> and frozen food boxes and weird plastics that aren't bottles. And you'd be surprised the kind of things people can put in a recycling cart. Um, so those, those things do get, for the most part, get thrown away because the, the sorting facility never said they wanted them. So they're, uh, sometimes they have a hard time trying to find a way to recycle them. <coughs> Um, as for the collection rates, we're not requesting a, a rate adjustment. Uh, and of course, mentioned this in his staff report. I just wanted to clarify, we have an operating ratio range in our contract. And normally we would take a CF CPI based adjustment each year, unless taking that adjustment would push us outside the range. And at least back in March, that's what we thought would be uh, the, the case for, for Lafayette. So um, most rates uh, aren't changing. Um, the, the rates that are changing are the, uh, the ton rates for the, the big uh, drop boxes. So uh, if you're doing a big construction project or demolition, that sort of thing, um, those rates are changing because the, the landfill changes their rate. Uh, they charge us each year. Uh, it's a little higher than, than normally we see. It's about 6.3% uh, so the new garbage rate and same rate for construction and demolition rates is uh, $46.82 now. So that's, again, it's up more than, we, than we've normally seen. Uh, the reason for that is last year, after we'd already visited all the cities and, and, and requested the rate adjustments that we had, uh, the landfill actually charged us, uh, had a, we had a higher price increase from the landfill than that we'd expect. We don't have a contract uh, with the landfill. It's uh, They're open now and they will be for some period of time, but it's been uh, difficult to sign any kind of long-term agreement for a facility that where we aren't sure it will be there to honor that commitment. So we operate without a contract. It means we, we pay the same rate per ton as uh, someone with a large trailer full of material. So. Uh, okay, so the, really the only, uh, the only, um, there is, other than the debris box ton rate, there's no adjustment to our citizens this year, right. is what you're saying. Right, that's correct. Okay, so, and um, has anybody talked about glass and styrofoam are not allowed in our, um, in our recycling and stuff like that? Has there that's been, true. Has there been anything that, to add that to Lafayette? Um, so, in at least in Oregon, no one that I'm aware of collects glass with the other recyclables. So when they collect it, it, it is separate. Um, so you, you have the option of adding uh, uh, glass recycling uh, as a separate service. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if we've worked up a quote for that, but uh, it's something we've, <coughs> we've talked about with some communities. McMinnville added it a couple of years ago. Um, and so it is possible to collect glass. It just does need to be separate. So a separate truck. Uh, and uh, could you guys work up a quote on us and yeah, let us know how much yeah, that's going to cost? Who's going to ask the same thing? So thank you. So unfortunately, Chris, we don't have glass in Forest Grove, where I used to live. There was um, the recycling garbage service gave us little red tubs for yeah. totes for separate for glass, and that they were 
they, they were picked up separately, but on the same day as, you know, the rest so of the So there'll be a quote with like multiple options, like whether that's widespread where everybody gets billed for it or individual sign-up services like we do with yard debris. Can we get a breakdown of what that looks like in each of those RAM? Because um, I know there's multiple ways that can be done throughout a city. And we're talking glass only, not glass and styrofoam, or? No, I'd like to see styrofoam too. Add it to it, okay. I'd like to see what the cost would be to add glass pickup and styrofoam because McMinnville you can McMinnville you can take the styrofoam and they don't charge you. If we go to McMinnville with the styrofoam they charge us. Right. So that's what I would like to find out is is you know because a lot of the um, packages and stuff are coming down with portions of styrofoam in it. And what do you do? Put out garbage. <laughs> so break down on that one too. So what it would look like with you know, when it's spread out throughout all of the citizens where there's an increase to everybody's bill, yet we all have the service available to us, or um, whether, or when it's a service that individuals can sign up for, you know, say six people on this street want glass service, but not all 12, right. are the 12 not getting it? No, well, it should be just more. like the um, yard debris. Right, but I'm saying some cities do both. Like some, it, it, it can be done both ways. I think it's important to have both of those close to know what we're looking at here. We're looking at, you know, a dollar for everybody's, you know, bill to go up to provide glass for second everybody, or is it more significant where, wow, maybe that should only be for the people who want it, no. if it's a significant yeah. amount. Yeah. Yeah. Both options. Excellent. Yeah, and, and correct me, David, I mean, at your recycling center in McMinnville, you take glass we and styrofoam for free um, for, from customers. We take Glass for free, but Mayor Schmuel is, is right that current that McMinnville approved a separate uh, rate adjustment to allow their residents to drop off styrofoam in their cars. Not free. Um, oh, every McMinnville. Other customers are are welcome to bring in styrofoam, but there is a charge, oh, I and uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I think it's like three dollars a bag. I could be wrong. Okay. Okay. Um, so if, if you could yes. work those up for us, that would be great. That is a thing we can do. And uh, uh, Catherine Bernard, you're right. Uh, we, uh, with, usually within the same community, we, the, well, the council ultimately picks one uh, program or the other. So we don't have areas of, this, of the same town where it's included and in areas of town where it's since we're usually right. that decision right. is made sort of once for the for the whole town. Obviously, you, you, you do have yard debris service uh, as a subscription. Yes, yeah, that so, you know some people may you know depending on what kind of vehicle they have, they may want to take their styrofoam and their um, glass themselves and pay the thing and not do a month to month thing. Some other people may want it attached. Like I don't want a garbage. I don't want a um, a yard debris service because I have a guy that comes and does it and takes the yard debris. So I don't get the yard debris. Stuff. Right. So I want I want to be able to pick and choose what I want to do. Right. And, and the way it works for us, or the way I should say, the way it has worked for us uh, on, with subscription service, for example, yard debris here, we we started on a, on a trial basis and we said, look, we don't know if anybody wants this. We think a few people do, but we don't know how many. Right. There's some magic number out there of, of customers where it makes sense for us to drive the truck out here and, and make stops. Um, currently, the number of year debris customers is uh, like 279 out of uh, about 1,300. Um, and you did customers. that with the drive with, you did that, you guys did that with the yard service. Right. When you first started. Right, and and that's, we our proposal would have something similar. We'd say, okay, we, after 12 months, we would reevaluate. So you only have six customers that have signed up. Either we need to talk about not offering it, or it would it would increase the price for those for those customers. Um, I think for yard debris, the target number for after the first year was uh, something like 100 customers um, per class. It, it may be uh, different. The, the deciders are, are different people now than those people were then. But uh, the same the same basic uh, uh, process would, would be involved. I think at least that. I, I'm going to write the proposal, so I'm pretty sure that's how the proposal will look. That would be great. So if you could do that, that would, we would appreciate that. Sure. So, um, anybody else have any more questions for this gentleman? I got a silly question. What is a great pomace or coming so not good or like that? So uh, it it was. I had to. I someone had to tell me so that it's not. It's not an automatic thing. Uh, so if you're 
a winery and you crush the grapes to make wine, you've got uh, liquid in one bucket and all the stems and seeds and skins and leftover stuff like uh, in the other bucket. And that's that's pumice, <laughs> pumice with the, oh, with an oh, oh, pumice. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have a rate for it just in case you open a, a winery uh, that uh, it's been processed on site. Um, um, the other thing I would mention is um, the, the race sheets you have and, and the letter you had say uh, effective date August 1st. Mm -hmm. So we weren't able to make it to your uh, July meeting uh, to do that. So the effective date it, you know, with your approval tonight would be September 1st. Uh, so want to clear that. Uh, yeah, uh, Dave, just to tag on to that. Effective yeah. September 1st. So who knows what that is? And three pages of the rate sheet need to be at the top there, just need to be changed to September. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the first page is correct, but the, the others don't. So we, we would adjust that with the resolution. Yeah. That's weird. All four pages of mine say, say eight ones. <laughs> The first one says nine one on mine, and then the, the rest are nine are eight one. So. Yeah, we'll just be clear on that. Okay, I maybe maybe um, oh, somebody had the right idea. That's weird. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Uh, okay, Jeff, yeah, I move to approve resolution twenty twenty dash eleven, College of Western Oregon. Late, effective September 1st. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, guys. We're on to our next one. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks Bye. for having me. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Okay, grant request for Lafayette Cemetery. Now, I don't know who is, I guess, Preston, you want to tell us what's going on here? Uh, I can. Uh, <clears throat> or did somebody on the council request this? Uh, uh, Johnny uh, Edwards okay. from the McMinnville uh, uh, Masonic Lodge put together the request uh, because they purchased the cemetery in, I think it was 1890 or maybe 1870. Uh, it's in the materials here. Uh, eight, they purchased it in 1870 and they have been maintaining it, you know, ever since. And uh, uh, Councillor Newman has volunteered to clean and uh, maintain the cemetery. So uh, she also called me to uh, suggest that uh, McMinnville uh, uh, consider applying to the city of Lafayette for uh, uh, a grant to uh, because of the history that's that's there in the in the uh, cemetery and, uh, and and you'll you'll see in uh, Mr. Edwards' uh, request letter he's uh, listed some of the more prominent members uh, in Lafayette history, especially uh, Mr. Gates who's very prominent in our history and talked about his home being in Lafayette and is the almost oldest home in Yamil County. Uh, uh, and um, it is. I saw that today. I was like, that's the Gates house. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, personally, I've been to the cemetery. It is, it is just a beautiful spot overlooking uh, Mineral Springs Road on two sides. Uh, they still do active uh, burials, uh, and uh, and it's uh, 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 the, the one question I think you had mentioned, Marie, about uh, it, it's not open to the public. It's not that much, but they are looking to open it once a month on a Saturday or a weekend, uh, in addition to just. Memorial Day, basically, uh, to to uh, allow people more opportunity to get up there and see the history. And it, 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 when I was there last Memorial Day, it was very well maintained. You could see the damage, and and it's it's heartbreaking. It really is. And uh, so, 
So uh, Councillor Newman had discussed with Mr. Edwards about our uh, uh, history and what we do special to honor our history and have markers and it's in our vision statement and all. And so uh, uh, he, he said, well, you already had your grants thing. I said, well, th this doesn't apply to our normal grants thing. This is out of sequence and the council could take up a grant like this at any time during the year. So, so uh, Sheila, would you like to add to that? Well, I thought Johnny was gonna be here. Oh. <laughs> so I um, haven't heard from him in a couple of days. Anyway, so I'm not sure if anybody is aware, but I have been working with Johnny and with Greg about doing some cleanup on this very important cemetery. The other thing, I, well, the first thing I'd like to clarify is it's not just a Masonic cemetery. The original portion of the cemetery where two senators, the two up there, the two, cemetery, two senators are interred, um, was originally from the Johnson family. And the Johnson family is who owned the Mineral Springs Resort and whatnot and the property up there. Um, so after that family sort of moved on, um, the Masons or Masonic bought the outlining surrounding area to use for their burial. So they've taken responsibility for the Johnson section or the pioneer section of it, but it really is two sections of one cemetery separate. So there's also a very... Very sad to see that there was about 50 headstones toppled sometime in March and toppled as in broken um, soapstones, um, headstones break very easily. Um, the damage up there is just astronomical. Um, so speaking to Johnny, he basically said that in the 80s, there was a lot of vandalism and theft where people, it was very popular to come in and steal headstones and put them in your own yard. Sure. So that's when the gates um, sort of got closed. So it's not that it's not open to the public. It's just a matter of trying to protect what's left of our history up there. So is it a historic site on a historic register? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it is, but I know that... Um, Shouldn't it be on there so that there would be history? I know that the state... Available? I know that the state talked to the Masons about it um, and kind of got them in a little faster gear because, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's on and off. It just depends who the caretaker is, right? And mm -hmm. if they change caretakers, maybe it gets neglected for a year or two, and then somebody else comes in and they take care of it for a couple of years. So I know the well, state... Isn't the, isn't the, whether they have a caretaker or not, isn't the Masonic Lodge organization... Um, Supposed to be overseeing it. They they do. They they are supposed to cut the grass and you know have it accessible from from the um, bushes and, and keep it you know maintained. Now I would be incorrect on the term, but there's a sexton. Is that the term? Yeah. The sexton is in charge of it, and Johnny's been in charge of it for almost two years now. Mm -hmm. So he sort of inherited the damage and the issues, and he's working very hard to um, organize. So he was basically handed a folder of paperwork, and it was all misinformation about who was buried where, and um, there was headstones that were... Well, I know, I used to live by the Eugene, at the, in Eugene, Oregon. It has a hill. And when we were little, we used to run up there, but we were afraid to run across there because we, the the the, um, the graves would fall in on you because it, it, and it was just I mean it was, it was you know they had, they had a mausoleum that was all you know all cemented the windows were cemented up and somewhere I mean it was a spooky place. Sure. Nightmares are made of. Uh, oh, let me tell you one thing: I had a lot of nightmares, so I know what I know what a decrepit or an unkept cemetery looks like. The question that I have is. What is the cemetery up here, up where you are at? Dunaway Pioneer okay. Cemetery. Who owns that? Mm -hmm. I don't know who owns it. Um, the Yamhill County Historical they Society. They take care of it. Yeah, I don't know. And, and, and is it in the city limits? No. 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 Neither of these cemeteries are in the city limits. Okay. Um, and, and the difference Milliken, about the Milliken, Eliza Milliken, who's, who's our western valley, the creek here, is our is our city limits. 
he's buried up there. The creek's named after him because of his donation land claim. And there's two um, shampoo signers from 1844 and 1846 that are buried up there. Um, you know, the first provisional government we had out here. So, well, the, you know, the question that I have, and I don't think, you know, $2,500 to me isn't a lot of money, and it's not a big deal for the, I don't, for the city. I think most of the citizens would say it's great to help out. I would wonder if it shouldn't. We shouldn't be having them check on the historical part of it, where it can be designated a historical site, and then they'll have more money. Johnny is it. in the process of, like I said, categorizing the graves and who is actually buried where, finding all the information and the cross information from people that just didn't keep track of those records first, so that we can um, discover who all is actually buried there. Um, me and Greg found a um, Civil War vet that was buried, his grave was about 20, 30 feet down in blackberry bushes, and his obituary said that he was actually buried in the McMinnville Cemetery, not in the Lafayette Evergreen. Cemetery. I thought he was an evergreen. Yeah. No. So there's I'm a lot sure of that. Gonna, I'm sure that they're going to find a lot of fun, and it's probably <laughs> going to be a lot of fun, too, because mm -hmm. you're probably going to really... It's going to so open your eyes. Our so town curse, right? Or we're you're going to burn three times. Well, the victim of that is buried up there, Corker. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, so funny because they say it's the Pioneer Cemetery. Well, that's this the one that always say it's that one. That's yeah, the, yeah. He's buried, Corker's buried up here. And according to the, the obituary, not obituary, but the after they hung marble that said they buried him up there, but there's no record of that anywhere, you know. So finding out, first of all, categorizing the graves that are damaged, which he's done a lot of work to do that, and then figuring out who's actually buried up there, which there's been several people that have helped him along that process. He also was completely unaware that there was grants available or any help whatsoever. And so he manages two cemeteries. He also manages the Minville one. So he's trying to do his best to figure this all out so that he can help um, preserve it and to restore some of the graves to the best of his ability. Well, I mean, I don't think there's any, any no, nobler cause that the city could give money to. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with the $2,500. The only thing I would request is that I would like to have them work so it's open more often yeah, so that we can that. enjoy them you know, a bit more. And I think if you did that, you would get more people to donate to the upkeep of it in the first place. They're working and on a security paying. system, basically. Yeah. Because of where the cemetery, I don't know if you've been on there, I, I know. where it's located, there is no really super close homes. Mm -hmm. And people wander up there on bicycles, but that's who's doing most of the damage. And so that's why the gate is closed most of the time. They're working on getting a camera system. They're working on a report system, like who is going out, you know, kind of doing the rounds to see if there's cars parked at the bottom or the base of um, where the gate is. So they're really working towards getting it open because that's one of the things that I've had a conversation with Johnny about. And I know that Preston's had the same conversation with him. Well, guys, it's up to you. No, and it is open. It is open. You just have to find a place to park and hike up the hill. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be really, really nice and inviting if the gate was open a couple of times a month. Which is something that I've talked to Jeff about. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a nice cemetery. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I'm in favor of it. Uh, would like to suggest another stipulation, though. Oftentimes, you give money to projects like this and then you have no idea of whatever happened. Um, I'd like to request some type of feedback, maybe some before and after thoughts or well, actually, some type of a formal report so that if we were ever asked by a citizen about what happened with that money, we could say, hey, they came from this. He has a Facebook I, page. I also, and with that, I think what we should do is stipulate that the money goes to the cemetery and not to the Mason's general fund. He's using all the money appropriately. Yes, that's, 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 that's fine. I just just a stipulation that it is to be used for the cemetery and only the cemetery, whatever it needs. You know. And wait to answer your question. There is a Lafayette. Um, well, it's McMinnville Lafayette Masonic Cemetery page on Facebook, and it shows a lot of the before and after. Um, unearthing the graves that are, like I said, buried 20, 30 feet deep in the blackberry bushes, writing the headstones, putting them back on top of the base wherever it's possible. So if you look on that page, I took 
63 pictures of all of the damage very up close and personal when I was working on it. So you can see the damage to just that cemetery, as well as the improvements that they're working towards the McMinnville Cemetery, because the McMinnville got, Cemetery got the grants first. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only reason why that work got started there first, but it shows very clearly that they have to have a specialist that's, that knows how to deal with the old limestone headstones as well as the granites and writing the bases so that the headstone stands up straight, that kind of thing. Right. So you can see a lot of that information. I think what he wants to do is come back and report. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We would like to report in what's okay. six months. Okay. Yeah. Jeremy, I think that's something he wanted to report. Well, I was just going to point out that, especially with the way times are right now, a lot of people are exodusing social media. <clears throat> So directing folks to a Facebook page to see what the money is being used for is unrealistic yeah. because a lot of people are leaving social media. So a report from the city council will be more You know, and what, what we can do is I'm sure that Kevin and Preston could probably put a link on our website, you know, to where the money was spent and what's going on. And, and that would probably further your cause. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> Okay. okay, guys, it's up to you. I'm going to make a motion. Uh, uh, Your Honor, if I could suggest to capture what the council was talking about, there is a suggested motion there, and, and I suggest and report back on how the money was used. Report back to the city on how the money to was the used. Council. Okay, yeah, and report. Back to council on how the money was used. Got that done? Okay. And is this something that I should not be voting on because it's a project that I'm working on? No. Okay. I'm just checking. Give it a big to hug, sure, man. To make sure that I'm not. We're not writing the check to you. So I know, but okay. I know, but just you know, just you're, to like you're, you're 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 personally benefit financially. Keep it real, you know. Yeah. Like, you know. Uh, yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> I move to approve a donation to the Lafayette Cemetery, amount of two thousand five hundred dollars for the repair of. Of accidentalism at the cemetery and report back to the council on how the money was or utilized. Is probably better. Go ahead and second. Aye. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. What's our next one? Okay. Utility bill. Okay. So, um, you want to talk to us about how you're going to set up this payment plan policy related to the pandemic? Uh, I'd be happy to, Your Honor. Uh, uh, it it's summarized there, kind of in the towards the bottom of the staff report. But basically, there's three elements to it. Uh, uh, we would uh, we would handle all delinquencies in the city the same. You know, whether you had it before March or got it, you know, during the last few months. And and this this period, you know, ends basically at on August 20th billing cycle. So going forward, all the folks who have a delinquency will be put on a payment plan to pay one sixth of their amount every month going forward. So that means you have September, October, November, December, January, February. So everybody pays what they're supposed to. By February of next year, we should be caught up to oh, By March, basically. But yes. You wouldn't, yeah. start it. Well, you wouldn't start at this billing cycle. You can start at well, September. Correct, yeah. 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 August 20th. So then the first payment would be due September 20th. Uh, the following month. So it's, it's, all, it's all delayed. Uh, so October, November, December, January, February, March. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so we would track all of that. Everyone gets an individual letter to state the repayment plan. Uh, uh, you won't notice anything different on your bill statements in terms of the dollars. You'd still have a delinquent amount. You'd still have what's due. Uh, so going forward, folks would have to not only keep the current bill you know, uh, 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 not delinquent, you know, keep their current bill current, but also make payment on the past six months. 
So will the bill show this is what you owe currently, and then this is what you owe to pay the six month to a grand total? Will no. It, will, it, will it show it separately? Well, we're talking to the, the customers that fall into the delinquency. They're going to get two things. You've got your normal city bill that just has your total amount delinquent. Then you have individual letters that will state the payment uh, of uh, one-sixth. Uh, now, the plan isn't to send out those individual letters every month, but initially to tell everybody, here's your payment plan, and they they would agree to that. There is a... Uh, so you can't add that to the current bill, the current bill that comes out every month. You can't add one-sixth of what they owe to the bill to get a total. As an itemized, like here's what you currently owe, here's that what you owe... Here's, the, one here's the amount you would pay for this month towards your back payment. Otherwise, you're asking people to just remember right, to add that on there. Well, everyone that will show the delinquency on the bill. Yeah, the total amount delinquent. Yeah, but yes. not the one six or their yeah. rate. No. And payment. to add that, I think is going to be. But if it, if, it, if it shows the total delinquency and it shows you the current bill and it gives you a uh -huh. total, isn't that a little confusing? No, it's nothing different than what we have now. But right now we're not taking that total amount and saying, oh, but you only have to pay a sixth of it. Right. So it is changing. Well, but the letters we send out to everyone that would fall into this program, uh, th that letter would be very clear what it is, and, and, and folks agree to that. They, every, every account, every person agrees that this is a, a payment plan moving forward. So basically, Preston, what you're telling us is that you can't do what we ask. You, you're the, the billing system can't do that. It isn't, it isn't set up to do where it shows the current and one-sixth of what they pay. It, it, it's, that's what it sounds to me like. And I understand what you're saying, what you're doing. But what I'm saying is that obviously you can't adjust the way the bill looks. We can make adjustments, but I want to bring Kevin in to answer that question. Okay. Uh, I, th I think it's going to take a long, quite a significant amount of time to make that change. All you have to do is be able to put in an entry that says one sixth of this amount posted. So people can't do that. Yeah. There are no people who don't know how to do one sixth of the total. Hey, no, they don't. So let me let me let Kevin address a little bit. So. First of all, the letter that Preston's, Preston's talking about will have it broken out with the additional monthly payments specified on that letter, and they'll have to sign it and return that to us. So they'll have a, have a, a record of the additional amount they'll have to pay each month. Unfortunately, we can't break that out on each bill without substantial reprogramming, which would be very expensive to do because our system is, is older than, than a lot of them. So, because you would have to rebuild some of the access tables and you have to reprogram the, the way the template works and you have to reprogram the macro to get it done. So that's that's why it, it, it just can't be done quickly and easily. But the initial letter won't just have a total, it will have a broken Correct, yeah. it, it will have this it broken out. Extra payment you, will, you will pay this in addition to your, your, app, your bill every month. And um, so- hey, On that letter, what I would like to see is if you say you pay this October, November, December, sure. January, sure. February, sure. March. I want every month shown out. Sure. We, we can do we also have that letter done in both English and Spanish? Oh, yeah, we'll have to find somebody to translate it, but yes. I, I think that's really that. important because a lot of people just pay their bills and, and aren't fluent enough in one language or the yeah. other to understand this letter that's breaking down something. So on one side, you have the English, and on the other side, the you have Spanish. Says, yeah. Yeah. However, it needs to be done. But it, it needs to be one side English and one side Spanish. Uh, okay. uh, was it our plan, Kevin, to send out an update of that every month, or just do the one letter initially, and 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 we're, um, we track it every month? Yeah. We know who might. So, if I'm money. understanding this correctly, the initial letter is basically to get agreement mm -hmm. for them to that plan to that payment Correct. plan. Okay. So that's that's different than sending out a bill. It's a, yes. a payment it, it, plan. It will be right. completely okay. separate from the bill. It will right. not be going out with the bill. It'll be going out on a separate, probably so colored paper. Back? They're, yeah. they're not agreeing to the payment plan, and they're, they'll have to pay it just as usual. They'll have to pay it all, or it goes to, to shut off. That's but we need. Are you, you going to give that? You, you need to make sure that you put a paragraph in there that's like bold that says it. 
If you do we not do. return this, you will be yeah. liable for the total bill at one time. We do. Yeah. We have that language in there. Okay. No, no, they, no, they're, sorry, another question. So say they don't return it. Huh? They get this big bill. They're like, I can't pay that. They don't pay it. Their water gets shut off. When they come in to get their water, hopefully turned back on, would you then be, set, be able to set up a payment plan for them? Um, we would. We do that with people individually now. And if okay. we've got a couple of folks who have called us ahead of time saying, hey, I'm going to get laid off. Can we work out some even before they've been delinquent? My answer is, of course. Um, there are some folks that we've we've had trouble with that over the years. So there are some folks will say, "No, we've done this with you before. <laughs> We're not going to go down this road again." Um, that's we don't. We've kind of cleared most of those folks off our books lately, but um, there it still happens. To go back to Christine's question, let's say that I get my water shut off because I couldn't pay. Mm -hmm. So I come in to pay it. Now, do I have to pay the full six months and the current stuff to get it turned back on? Or do I full. just have the current and bring my six payments up to date? Uh, it has to be, if, if they agree to it and miss a payment or don't pay the extra, then they have to pay the full full delinquent balance to get a return from stores. Um, we, we've got, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if they call us, maybe we can work on something like that. But it's there's enough accounts that we have to be a little bit strict on this. We are mm -hmm. give, you know, giving folks a tremendous amount of leeway on this. I just want to make sure that we're flexible enough that we can handle that we don't make somebody somebody go without water that can't afford it. Well, yeah, and that's part of what this is trying to do. But it also we also have that the, the fiduciary obligation to make sure our, the system is is recovering the, the funding necessary. I understand that. I understand and that's that. what we're trying to balance. I understand that. But we can't have a family of three no. sitting up here with no water. No. And that's and that's what this plan is trying to avoid. And so it's, it's a case by case situation. Okay. That's all I want to do is make sure that they're flexible enough that oh, yeah. they can do some things. Yeah, the whole idea of how many um, how like what's the percentage that we're talking about? Like, um, for the total right now, the we're about a, a, we have about three hundred and thirty-five accounts that are delinquent in some state or another. So that's three hundred out of fourteen hundred. So you're looking. Right. I don't know what. But what that does here. include current month. And a lot right. of people are delinquent one month and they get a cut up. Yeah. So yeah, there are more than a few folks who use delinquent notices as reminders to pay their bills every month. So <laughs> there there are some folks that are in that category that. They're not a long-term delinquency, so they're... No, and, you know, and I understand, because I have I have to work with people, too, on payments and stuff like that. The only thing that I've learned is that the more flexible you are, lots of times you will create a customer that is absolutely wonderful. Oh, absolutely, and that's, and that's one of the reasons why we didn't want to just specify a certain time period. We wanted to see if we could clear as many going to account, accounts as possible and bring anybody back to current. Okay. Now, let's see. I don't want to suggest trying to create more work for you guys, but is there any way to put a reminder in, um, so they get the initial letter that says, this is your monthly payment on your delinquency. The next month they get their regular water bill. Is, could there be a note somewhere that says, don't forget to pay a sticky note, something. your uh, extra delinquent payments? That... <laughs> well, we're gonna have to probably do that. Uh, Wade, uh, uh, and because we'll know, uh, we're tracking every month yeah. for possibly 200 and some accounts, you know. Yeah, uh, but like, I imagine there's a lot of people who will just, they'll get their, they'll pay their water bill and just totally space off the fact that they owe this delinquent. Well, the, that delinquent amount will still be on there, so they will yeah. still see. The delinquent amount it, it won't come off the bill until it's paid oh it will show up on every bill oh yeah exactly. oh, the total amount they owe, which, which is the same thing they've been used to seeing on every single bill right. yeah. them, so it's not like this is a new thing right no, no, that's that's correct but what i'm saying is because they've gotten used to seeing this delinquent amount growing on their bill this next month is not going to trigger anything new for them be like oh i'm supposed to start paying well it will be after they got a month before yeah, but that occurs after they've agreed in writing to the payment plan. Everybody, or, or don't apply. You've got to agree to the payment plan. Yeah, and that's why we had to, we, we decided to, to recommend that be an affirmative step so, so, so folks have to take some kind of personal action. So that it also sticks, it also gives us the authority to 
uh, step outside our normal process because they have that agreement. Otherwise, we have to just, based on our billing policies and our, our code, we have to just go to shutoffs. So can we just include a letter stating, like, if you're on a payment plan, remember to pay that. I mean, maybe not giving the total because they show up on everyone's, right. Yeah, just show up on everyone's. And because, you know, they'll have a copy, I guess, of the initial letter. They could always call you to find out the specific amount. But then that way we are giving that extra reminder we can do them. You know, and like on the back of the bill. Yeah, that's what I was going to say that bill has some you know, move something around on the back of that bill that you put something there that says, remember to pay your delinquent yeah. amount or your one sixth yeah. amount. Or even if it's a little a slit that's stapled that on, you know. Well, like that. And, 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 so the, the, way that, the way that the way we do the bills is that's what the machine is. <laughs> so we don't hand, have to hand fold 100, what, 1,414 bills. Right. So if we staple something to okay. it, it destroys the machine. And that makes you sense. You have to include uh, so, like, we, we have two slots that we include the, the newsletter and the bill. That's why it's sometimes hard for us to throw a third one in because we just don't have the machinery to do it easily mm -hmm. uh, without taking us a week and a half just to do the bill. Okay, I think we've, I think we've um, beat that dead <laughs> Well, I think we need to talk a little bit more about, you know, you're talking about flexibility and all that, and you give – your city administrator some discretion to deal with bills and and we apply that but we don't apply it in mass we understand everybody. that we understand that uh, uh, so okay, as long as you're comfortable with that. all we're telling you is that we want you to be flexible and not put somebody in a dire situation if they are yeah. if they have a problem that's all we're asking yeah. Okay. Which is the same flexibility that I'm assuming you would give anybody, mm -hmm. despite the COVID situation. Exactly. <laughs> this is not an uncommon yeah. situation for us to deal with customers one on one in your thing. You know, for instance, if somebody has a, a leak that just absolutely blows out their bill, we we've got some processes to, to handle that, but we also have a payment plan to handle what portion they're responsible for. We, you know, we we had folks who just didn't pay it and racked up a huge bill. And, we tried to work with them to get that down to, to keep them in service. Some folks, there's nothing you can do, and they're just not going to pay their bill. And so we hate getting to that last step, but on occasion we have to. But okay. we, we really do try to work. What's the next one? The six month repayment. What was the next one we wanted to talk about? The late fee and disconnection to apply? That's applying some discretion where we can, but basically that that last note is what the policy is that's set for the city. Okay, so is there something we need to discuss other than that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's important for the date specific here. Uh, I didn't include that in the motion. Maybe I should have, but the... The suggestion is that this would begin with the August 20th billing cycle. So through basically August 19th, that's the end of this delinquent period that then becomes going forward amount that you pay one sixth on. Okay, so guys, how are the people that you talk to, how are they? Are they ready for us to change this? I think we need to give if we're gonna send this out, send this out in a month in advance. Yeah. So it's on next month's bill. I agree. I think um, so you want it September twentieth. September twentieth. Yeah. yeah. I think we have to give them that a little bit extra notice, and that could possibly help with collecting the delinquent amount, so people can't say I didn't know or I couldn't prepare for this. <laughs> yeah, we we don't actually bill this October August twentieth to September nineteenth cycle, you know, until. Uh, uh, the first payment basically is October. October with so. this setup here. Oh, okay. okay. So, so, well, with yeah. this setup, it would be September. No, no, no. With this set, with, with the setup he's got here, the letters will go out in August. Okay. Okay. To remind them that in September, on September twentieth, they'll start, which is due until okay. October twentieth. Right. Oh, okay. Then I think this okay. date's absolutely so, fine. August, right. August. So, yeah, I was just off on no, that. That's okay. confusing as to. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure they have ample notice. Okay, right. Ready for a motion? Yep. I move to direct staff to implement the payment 
plan policy related abilities bills related to the pandemic beginning with the August 20th, 2020 billing cycle. I second Speaker. that. Okay, 8.30. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I was throw that in. <laughs> going up to the next floor. Right along. <laughs> oh, move on. More time, buddy. Okay, can I have a second to that? I second it. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Unanimously passed. Okay, now we have somebody that's supposed to be here from ODOT uh, at 8.30. We do have uh, uh, Valerie Greenway here, uh, uh, if you want to do that, or, or take the next item, either way, whatever you like. We can, yeah. we'll just switch oh, those if okay, she's gotcha. there, that's what I'm saying. No, okay, can, gotcha. oh, do you want, does she want to wait for 10 minutes? It's not going to take us that long to take care of that, or do we want, let's finish that one. So okay. We're done with our section. Yeah. Okay. Um, city utility donation program. We've amassed thirty-five hundred dollars. Thirty-five thirty-two. Thirty-five thirty-two. <laughs> so, Preston, maybe you can explain how it's going to be distributed. Yeah. Uh, well, Your Honor, there is a process here, uh, and and I've tried to capture uh, the confidentiality of it, plus uh, uh, make it so the award is substantial. That's why number seven talks about a, the amount we would target per account would be $200. No, if it doesn't, if, it, if they don't owe $200, you're not going to give them $200. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, correct. Uh, up, okay. and, up to. Up to. And so I think we've kind of hinted at a little bit about the process, but, but the recipient qualifications, I wanted to be real clear with that. Uh, we, we felt it was be very important to begin the eligibility of this with accounts in good standing as of March 20th. These, this is when the, basically the declaration and uh, state of emergency began in you know, late March. So uh, uh, the eligible folks would have been in good standing as of that date. Do you know approximately how many accounts were not in good standing that would not qualify for this? There is an idea of that number, yes, but that would be a Kevin question. Uh, so let me ask him about that. Uh, Kevin, do you have an idea of how many that maybe weren't in good standing? <laughs> The video. Uh, uh, yeah, I followed on, on YouTube in the back and typing up minutes. So, um, <laughs> it, it, there were only about thirty-five accounts that were not in good standing as of March twentieth. Um, I guess my issue with this is those thirty-five fa families likely were delinquent because they're already struggling on money, and so then the pandemic hits; they're likely going to be hit more than these other families. Or, you know, just as much. And I just think to disqualify them, that's pretty harsh. Because they're likely the families who need the most support with the children. You're kicking people while they're down. Yeah. Essentially. Well, we would never do that. So those 35 that are delinquent are going to probably take that most of the money. So anybody, you know, so. I mean, it. But if we're doing a flat rate for all the accounts that are delinquent. <laughs> I mean, we're not saying all 35 would get it because they were first in line and already delinquent first. It's, that, that, that's not how it works out. Well, the question, what are the question? Is it going to be a lottery where they just, you know, put everybody's name in a, in a it's thing and, and, chosen and roll and roll and, you know. I thought a flat fee would just be applied to all the accounts. Yeah. We don't have enough money to give everybody two hundred dollars, no. so we're going to have oh, okay. to pay somebody. So basically, the award would be about seventeen awards at two hundred dollars piece. If it all went out the door for tomorrow, for the yes. three hundred families that would yeah. then qualify. However, I do completely agree with Kayla that you know the circumstances of the people. I'm sure that you've worked with that are, were dealing with prior to the pandemic, so you would have a better idea of who is struggling financially. 
why don't we just open the door to allow the families to submit an application? Well, or... we only have 35 families that he said were struggling. If we put them all into a big basket and pick 17 of them, they may or may not get picked. Well, through a random number generator. Yeah. yeah a random number. Uh, 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 Kayla, what you're suggesting is uh, collecting more information. And, and, and Essentially, because maybe a family was impacted, but now they're, they return to work and they make six figures. And so they don't, they wouldn't benefit from this. But the, well, and so that's where it is, is, is it, how are you going to justify that you give them the money and some, not somebody else the money when they feel as though they're in the same situation? But that's where I'm saying if we open the door to allow people to submit a request to, you know, be considered for this grant or, you know, this donation program, you know, the people who don't need it likely aren't going to come apply for it. But the families who really do need it, they're going to jump on this. And then we know. And maybe at that point, you know, we open the window for so long. And if whatever applications we get, if there's enough for it to be divided to give a good amount, around $200, then that eliminates people having to pick and choose or do a lottery system. I don't, I don't like the city making a distinguished two people without something random involved because you're going to get into the point of... Well, it could end up being random. Well, that's what I'm saying is I would like to have... So many random. people come apply. Right. And so that's my thing. I mean, maybe not many will apply because, again, they're back to work and they're okay. What if they apply? Then you have to be a, you have to apply to... to Essentially be, con be considered. Be, be considered... Um, but your application is basically assigned a randomized number, which is then thrown into a lottery. And that's what I'm saying. I think that basically it, it's going to weave out the people who don't need people, it. Uh, I mean, basically, they're signing up for the potential to get this, right. yeah. understanding there's no guarantee. But that way, you, you mm -hmm. they have families, you know, as Kayla was saying, who have since gone back to work. And it is not a problem for them to do this six months. Well, why don't you look at it this program. way? Why don't you look at it this way? We collect this money and we go through the first three months of payment on it and the people that have not been able to pay and keep up are the ones that are needing it and that's how you give it. Possibly, because that could also just encourage people not to pay their Well, we don't tell everybody. No, don't tell anybody. We don't tell okay. anybody. Well, I mean... I mean, this is public record. Yeah. Public record. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> and you already told them. <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference. I mean, how many people mm -hmm. listen to these tapes? Well, I, would, I would hope I nobody just, would willingly not pay their water bill to potentially benefit maybe from a grant. Right. A water process. Right. Yeah. From um, a lottery. Yeah. So I guess for clarification purposes and agreement purposes, um, are we going to include the 35-ish families that were not in good standing or... Not. I mean, that it's a two-part question in my book that Kayla raised to start with. I think they absolutely should be considered because I think those are the families that are struggling more and there's likely children involved. And I agree with you. Makes sense. If it, and if, 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 it, if it's a random pick of some type, not an application type of pick, if it's a random pick, I agree with that. Right. Well, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be anonymous. Essentially, what I'm trying to Certainly, say is yeah. to take off some stress from the staff, you know, put this process in where they come in, submit the application to be considered, and that is that could eliminate a lot of accounts for us because families who don't need it aren't going to come submit an application. But if you have more than the amount of people, then we, we need to do the lottery and system. Then, and one person doesn't get, you don't accept, you don't give it to one person and you give it to another person, there's going to be some problem there. Not if it's so much. I'm saying they can process work though. Just because you're applying for a grant, we know this doesn't mean you're going to get it. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. Like but, lottery ticket. right? But then the person, the family who doesn't need the help, they're not going to potentially be the ones who are just automatically thrown in this lottery system. Mm -hmm. I like the application idea too, Kayla, because it also makes people do something to. Well, True. Yeah. You, you, we're not just handing out free money effort. to everybody. Yeah. You know, if you want this, you got to put out enough effort mm -hmm. to fill out a form. Yeah. You know that. that and the, the form doesn't have to ask financial. It does. Literally, 
What's your name account number? Yeah. I mean, what's your name and what's your address? We made the effort to come in and fill out. Yeah. So we say if you could benefit from this program and you'd like to be considered, if you are come submit your first, it has to be are you delinquent? And if you are, and you yes. could benefit. Yes. It's not just everybody. In the and obviously, city. this wouldn't apply to accounts well, that are good in standing city. and then go delete. Everybody in the city. Next month. Yeah, well, I don't know about Yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to help the families that are most need. And there are accounts on there that the people have returned to work and they're fine. They don't need this program. So. The more money we can help the families who need it, the less likely their water is going to be shut off with kids involved. So the proposal is include the 35, yes. some type of application process, but picking the recipients mm -hmm. is random, right? Yeah, the, yeah. 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 This has to, it should be random. The it absolutely is, should. It has to be yeah. random because otherwise you're going to have some people come and say, you know, I applied for it and I need it more than she did and she got it. And so, and again, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is if there's 50 accounts right now in hypothetical so numbers changing. that are delinquent, the only thing we're changing. but 20 families come down, put their name on a list or an application saying, I could benefit, please consider my application. We only have those 20. Those other 30 accounts aren't going to be considered in this. I understand that, but the 20 so, that are considered need to be a random. If we can only right. give 15 out. And that's true, that's but what I'm saying, random. possibly that 20, would we would possibly have enough for all the 20. If we don't, we like, then we need to do a lottery yeah. system. I agree. And that's where you're asking to be considered. You're not asking or requesting that it be done. No, if you want, if you want to go through an application, it's not have a problem with that, but in the end result... I think it should be a lottery system that picks out of those people. Right. And you're right. If we have, if only, you're right. If we only have 20 people and we can divide our, and give each person $200, heck, let's do that. But if we've got if we 40 lottery, people, you know, we can either decide whether we're going to give a certain amount of them 200 or whatever. Well, and I think we should just leave the basis. window open for donations to still come in while this yeah. process is yeah. happening. Oh, I know. So. I don't think we should do this until at least we're three months into right. the repayment plan. Yeah, I think that's, that's why. And, and that's fair, but I don't think that, you know, there should be a requirement that they make their monthly payment and their full delinquent amount. Well, I'm not saying that they have to do that. I'm just okay. saying that I think we should wait, wait a three little months bit. because of the fact that's going to do exactly what you say. People yeah. are going to go back to work. They're not going to need it. And that type yeah. of stuff. That gives them three months for that to come to fruition. Yeah. yeah. And that, hopefully that will lower the amount that is delinquent and maybe we can help out more families. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Does that work for you guys? Well, I, I think there's uh, a big uh, <clears throat> one major point here is uh, – uh, uh, if you're going to require applications, which is fine, then it should be a public process. Absolutely. Applications would be public and, and, and. And maybe it's even just a list. I don't know. Whatever is easiest for the staff. You know, wait a minute. Let me ask you this. If we, if we require applications, then do we have to display who gets the money? Well, I would say, yes, you should uh, either keep it confidential or don't. Uh, one of the two. Well, if we, if we ask for applications and keep the applications confidential, then we're still okay, right? We don't have to. We don't have to give anybody a list that says these are all the people that apply, do we? Well, I, you know, and who's going to do all this? You know, I'm going to make all those decisions. I'm not comfortable handling a lot of public information or confidential information. I don't want to handle confidential information. So, uh, so, so I say we bring it back in three months and talk about it. Okay. You know, okay. but it, it's, it's, it's good. it can be either a public process or not. I still think that there's a way for people to come in if they are delinquent and, and request a financial award or to be included in the financial award program with the name and address. So maybe at the next city council meeting, we discuss setting up the application process plan. I yeah. think we should. Because, okay. because I think we have to keep this a little at a time because yeah. clearly if there's... Yeah, the confidentiality yeah. thing is a big deal. It is. Yeah. It is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It is a big I'm deal. I'm considered all. Um, yeah, so, 
um, we let's could, just continue with what we're doing. You bet. And go on. And then, like you said, bring this topic. Can you bring this topic back next yes, month? You bet. And then we'll talk about it next month and see if anybody else has any better ideas. Yeah, there's nothing about. urgent with it. But okay. so, yes. That's yeah. Okay. Is everybody in agreement with that? I agree. Thank you, Preston. Yeah, you bet. Okay. Okay. Now we are ready for Mrs. Odai. <laughs> that here? Yes. That's it. That's and I think that um, Preston can introduce you. So, well, thanks, Your Honor. Um, some of you might remember Valerie Greenway. She's uh, the project manager for the uh, 99 Rebuild project coming at us, uh, and she was here to help facilitate the discussion on the on the uh, pedestrian walkways and uh, uh, the, the council agreed to back in November of, uh, uh, was it 2019? Uh, November of 2019? Yeah. It might have been the year before. Uh, uh, so so she, she has uh, helped walk the council through that. The council uh, approved the, the, uh, the crosswalk plan uh, for uh, the project. Uh, there's there's one lingering design thing on that, which I'll get into. Uh, but uh, 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 the, uh, the, the we've been working with ODOT for about two and a half years on the design of this project and discussion and all that, and it has uh, come to the point where uh, for using a federal monies and for timing of the project and all, uh, ODOT uh, wants us to take on the relocation of our water line and the services uh, as a separate project. And, and so this was not anticipated, it wasn't in our budget. Uh, ODOT has, uh, uh, since the staff report went out, sent us a letter. You all have that letter uh, dated uh, August 7th at your station. Uh, that letter goes a long way to uh, give us peace of, peace of mind uh, 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 to take on this project. And so the action before you tonight is to approve the agreement, basically, at, to, that this will be a reimbursement project. And there are uh, other items uh, of critical importance in my mind uh, to provide the peace of mind, and they've all been satisfied. Uh, discussions with Valerie uh, and her boss, John Hustis, who uh, uh, is not here tonight, the area manager. But, uh, 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 you know, we didn't have that peace of mind when we put the packet together last week, but I feel that we do now. Uh, but there is context. There is some background uh, I do want to provide. Uh, I've got a, a, a poster board here I want to bring out and talk about, uh, but uh, maybe Valerie, this might be a good time for you to kind of package this a little bit. So um, we are finishing the design of this project. It actually is oh, yeah. in, in our business yeah. process yeah. now. And what's happening is normally utilities, which are very common within our road right-of-ways, ODOT owns the right-of-way, and the utilities are the burden of the utilities. So we kind of come in and say, we're going to do this project and you need to accommodate us. So this was a little bit different situation. We do have these occasionally for various reasons if a uh, utility has an easement even. But the other thing that's nice is really the water lines are owned by the city. And so, you know, we worked with your city consultant engineer for the numbers and fully committed to 100% reimbursable on all those costs and really a pass through where, you know, we're going to expedite those invoices and make sure they're being paid promptly. And our timing, part of it is we don't have a lot of flexibility and nimbleness in those types of accommodations with this project. And we need this work done going into next year. The project will actually award this winter. They will start construction in various areas between McMinnville and here on sidewalks as early as January or February. We're still anticipating that the city work coordination can 
continue until April. And then the big paving project, because it's when we get into that big dig out of taking out this entire roadway that is going to have those impacts. So by the time they do that in the summer, that work needs to be completed. So that's the goal with it and the history of what brings us to where we are at today in the time. More context. Uh, so uh, so this, this is a... This is a, a blow up of the third and Madison intersection, basically, and how the impacts and what we're trying to do, particular with that intersection. Uh, but uh, you know, with, with, this, uh, uh, with this project that ODOT's doing, uh, uh, we're gonna come right behind. <coughs> when that's completed, and you're aware of this project, we talked about it on our CIP, we're finishing the design of that this year, and that's to improve, uh, uh, to take off where, you know, uh, uh, ODOT rebuilding 99. We would basically uh, do a half street improvement on Madison, create a right turn lane heading south on Madison, and then there would be a, a, a lane here that can go straight or uh, turn. Uh, <coughs> Two, two lanes in the, uh, what is the, that's the heading yeah, south. The, that's the correct. Turn, the turn lane yeah, the okay. turn. That's correct. And then you got the one turn, you know, one lane heading north. Uh, now, the reason why, and this project triggers the development of, of this piece. Uh, uh, and uh, this goes back uh, to. Uh, about four years, a public-private uh, agreement with the city and a former owner, the current owner, to redevelop these properties. Uh, and and, and uh, the reason why is because uh, this is our fire station right here. You, know, you, got, you got your entrance uh, into the fire station here. Uh, and uh, it used to be further down here, this is being City Hall right here. Uh, when this gas station was developed, you've got, you know, trucks that come in and hit the fueling paces, but they can't get out. There's not enough room for parking. Uh, uh, the, 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 the fire chief spends his day out there helping tanker trucks back in and out. It's ridiculous. So it's got to get fixed. That's why we did the agreement four or five years ago to fix this, to allow tanker trucks to pull through and go out to Madison and create parking here for their employees. So we're fixing that design uh, deficiency that the city approved about uh, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, so that's why this agreement was done uh, to develop this property. And the city will trigger this development when we put in these improvements along Madison and create this turn lane. So, so we solved the problem of tankers being able to come in one way they, they go, they, they come down one way and go through and they come out on Madison. And that way they'll get all their fueling done and everything. Uh, there, there's a house there, right? Preston? There is, correct, right here. And that goes away. Well, they, when the project is triggered, that correct. Those people are evicted and the house is demolished. Yep. It sounds cold hearted, but yes, <laughs> yes, that is exactly what they happens. They knew that according to um, John Lear when yep. he discussed the project. Yep. They knew that going into oh, yeah. that situation, so it's not new to them. Right. We've been talking about this project here right. for I think three, four well, years. years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is what does this have to do with, with improvements? With, with, with well, the water line. Okay. So hang on. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So, you need a new color for us. <laughs> so here, uh, I, know, one, we, I know this project is great for us to reiterate the information, but I'm just trying to figure out what this has to do with changing the water. Well, since they Marie, I'm glad you asked, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one thing that Valerie's still working on is the crosswalk here, across this island to get across. Okay. Uh, there's no crosswalks provided here, and that's what the council agreed to. But part of the council's motion to approve the sidewalk plan is to include a way across South Madison. 
and, and, and we have the existing sidewalk there. Uh, it's critical. Uh, it's critical to function uh, for all the kids that live south of Third Street to come up to Third, take a sidewalk all the way down to Monroe, which is the school crossing. Mm -hmm. Can't do that without a way to get across there. Now, you can get a, across on the north, but you've got to be able to cross here. It, it just has to happen. And you know? it's allowed, but it was not planned to be striped. That has to do with, because that has the, we call them pork chops, but the little island, mm -hmm. it doesn't meet the state architect standard anymore for having those line types. Really what they're doing is saying, we'd rather you cross on the other side. But I'm aware that that's been a, a preference of uh, the city the whole time. And I'm, really, it's an easy change for us. What Preston's goal is, is that it becomes incorporated in our project. Striping is the last thing we do. So the striping for that project won't be until a year plus from now. Um, so we may have some follow-up work with, with Preston to um, get that formally approved by the SAGE engineer. It's not just my traffic engineer and our region. It's actually a statewide item. So what you're, what you're guaranteeing us is that we're going to get a crosswalk that meets Preston's standards. We're trying to do that. Your standards. Yeah. You made the motion. <laughs> and and uh, But it's critical. That was a council decision. Uh, so we're still talking about Madison. Where is the biggest bottleneck in the city? And I'm not talking about Carmen Dick Gedden when Highway 18 got right. Yeah. Uh, which I should say was done very well by ODOT. We had flaggers out there. Way to go. It really was good. But the worst bottleneck, traffic bottleneck in the city is is when you're traveling north here yes. at the commute time. It's one lane and you and during normal commutes, you can see a couple times a week traffic's backed up clear to Terry Park. Yep. I get complaints about that. I say call ODOT. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, you know, I, I get a few concerns about crosswalks and things like bridge and this and that, but I get more about this from commuters. They're very upset. And the only way to solve that is really in combination, there's a couple things, is uh, to have a signal here. Uh, uh, but really what has to happen here is there has to be some right of way acquired so that you have a, a right turn lane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that- Claire, are you talking a crosswalk signal or a street light signal? We're talking street light okay. at that point. You know, without a street light, you have to have a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. But really to function really well, that's about the worst, you know, uh, uh, angle you can imagine. But that's, uh, that, that would, this would help, but I, I mention that only because I know we know it real well. Valerie's been caught into it. And if this doesn't happen, we're going to be at a failure at that intersection. We'll be like Dundee. It'll be 10 years before something gets done. So if what doesn't happen? Are you saying the sidewalk or the right-of-way for the right turn? Well, I'm talking about the right-hand turn here. I'm talking possible signalization here. Uh, this is only going to get worse. And and it, that that is going to pile up. It's a, it's a failure. And so is ODOT is, it, is ODOT in agreement with this, or are they are they would, would they look at this type of request? Or what? How are, where it would be a formal there? request, and of course the expansion is a local project, really, because that would be on the city to get the right away and and work through that this change. But you would want that approval with ODOT that if you can accomplish that. That the striping would be permitted for those dedicated turns at the intersection. But he's not talking about the striping, he's talking about a right away and a, yeah. Yeah. And a, and a yeah. light and everything yeah. else like the that. The stoplight is a uh, tough ask. We've discussed that before. Right. right. So, the, the, what's before us tonight really is part of the project the, 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 the water line, the, the ODOT rebuild, and we need the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. This part about failure at the intersection is more big picture. It's worth talking because we have an ODOT person right here. <laughs> Wonderful. They can hear it all. Record. But the ODOT uh, person is telling us that that's our responsibility. Not well, not really. Yes yeah. and no. But so it's, it's a partnership. Important. It's a collaboration. And it's going to be years and years of work to get it done. Uh, but uh, that's what's needed. 
You're going to have to remove a building. That's that's well, that's what happens. You know, yeah, <laughs> the traffic gotta, signal there. Uh, uh, but the uh, problem Dundee had before the bypass. We don't want to be there. That's correct. We don't but want to be like that. Dundee is right. what like really caused the problem. But exactly. that's what I'm saying. If we put a light there, exactly. are we going to be in the same boat as Dundee? Exactly. What that's Dundee that's why Odom well, said no. that was a hard sell. It is because hard sell. that would put us in the same position. But really, no, what I'm hearing, and it'll be kind of here before I get a bypass. Okay. If you, before we start the resurfacing project, is the time to decide that we want to put that right-hand turning lane in so that we can alleviate the problem. But especially with the fact that we're looking at a housing development coming in. Yeah, but that, you, got, you got to realize that that right-hand turn lane I know. Is, is a lot more than just a little bit oh, of room. I, I mean, we're talking two buildings there that are going to have to go. Right. And, I mean, I know. I mean I'm it's, aware not, of those it's not something that we can just say, let's do it. I know because we've already used our 60 foot right away, which is what we have in the city of Mafia is a 60 foot right away. And we've already used it there for the tri triangle turn lane that is no longer ADA approved. So that's where we're looking at. There's some significant issues going on. Well, I don't think the 60 foot right away was used for that. I mean, no, the, the, the proper, the 60 foot right away is already in use without the extra right hand turn lane. That's interesting. So, so what we're doing tonight, though, is addressing funding of the or ODOT essentially paying for the moving of the lights. That's where we are right now. Correct. What we're doing here. Right. 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 circle back around to get us back on track. Right. We're so, back. Okay. We're working around again. Yeah, yeah. This, this gives you context of what we're doing and how we're pulled into the project. This is more big picture future. So back to the uh, reality here of the picture tonight. Uh, uh, yeah. In my mind, the only thing the only thing that we have in front of us today is is okaying the pass through for um, the agreement with ODOT, and then also get and also scheduling a budget meeting to set up the pass through process. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, okay. and so I'm what I'm stating for you is. That the assurance is that uh, that you know will be technically not reimbursed, but this pass through, uh, mm -hmm. and and, uh, 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 and and all the other uh, conditions and things, uh, many of which were related to in the in the letter that you now have, uh, you know, it, you know, I've got the peace of mind that. To recommend the council approve this agreement, authorize you to sign it, and we move forward. Um, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable because the agreement doesn't fit us. It doesn't fit the situation, but it's what's required for to access federal funds, basically. And uh, we we've uh, worked out the details of how that's going to be processed and and designed and reimbursed for for uh, Gordon's time, our city engineer construction you've got in your packet there a uh, estimate of the of the cost of the construction as well as the engineering seven hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars odot has uh, looked at that money to pay for that separately if they have to uh, uh, so that we're not held holding the bag you know come come doing the project we got to pay the bills uh, and and we, we probably will have two, probably three total payments to a contractor. Uh, we're looking to bid in the project the 1st of September, probably opening bids on September 17th. Uh, by the time you get the contracts all in place, it's the end of October, which leaves us November, December, January, February, March, potentially four months to get the work done. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's a lot of work, uh, but it's a lot of trenching, a lot of shoring, a lot of uh, paving to, to, to once it's done and backfill and everything. Uh, and uh, who, who actually designs all that, Preston? If we have to reroute all the utilities and water for months, uh, this, this is only our water line through the side streets. It's not. We're not digging up the sidewalks, except where they might approach the corner for the side streets 
uh, that has to be lowered. And it's just not that section. You kind of have to angle it, you know, and, and, and we have about 15 services that are along third or a couple of the side streets. So we're looking at doing that work, not the other utilities. The, the, those things are being handled by the other utilities. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have another water project where on two, uh, in two spots, we are taking an eight inch main across through the right of way. That's, that's on our CIP list yeah, number no, one. So we're gonna bid all that together. You know, that portion of extending our mains is 100% paid for and designed by the city. In fact, we're ready to go to bid to that, lit that one, but we'll bid all that together and we'll keep the accounting separate for the two uh, so that you know ODOT pays for just what Gordon has designed on the main line relocation and the services. Okay. So he answered the question. Gordon is the one, <laughs> our designer is the one that will design all that real. stuff. Yeah. Right. He, and and he, that's he, why this partnering really came about because we were originally trying to incorporate the city improvement and then it was, yeah. you know, a little bit of a burden that way. And now we went the other way and said, let's do all the city stuff together. Mm -hmm. And speaking to the, the, work that's gonna be done. A lot of the city utilities are actually low enough and in the sidewalk. So my utility person goes through and we actually paid for borings back in June where they went in and verified these depths. The biggest issue is only here in downtown Lafayette, the road is so bad, which is why it looks the way it does, that they are going to remove 36 to 48 inches wow. down. <laughs> and so these water lines normally aren't a conflict for a standard paving project because we don't go that deep, but it's this huge excavation. And so when we come through with that, then there's also the question of maybe the quality of the lines. They've probably been there a long time. So the other win is the city at ODOT's cost and federal cost is gonna have that new connections. And then there's also some portions of the main that run down 99 and uh, third. And so, you know, overall, I mean, it's a lot of work. We know that. The other thing I can speak to is the conditions in the contract. A lot of it is DOJ standard that we're required to perform with. It's also related to this is funded by federal money. So there's a lot of requirements about that competitive bidding and things that it says, ODOT has to see this and ODOT has to see that. And we have to see all these invoices. That is standard process for us. And so even if the city hasn't been involved in a lot of those projects, we have the resources to say, here's what your invoice needs to look like. Here's what we're going to need. The difficulty is the contract's really long and cumbersome for something that's really like get out there and just do this, you know. <laughs> so that brings us to where what we tried to do with Preston's concerns was say we had four people in the room, four bosses, including Tammy, who's the head of the utility reimbursable program, who will be paying those invoices, say we can do this, you know. Um, Gordon gave us the estimate based on his 700,000. I already have it in the budget, moved and approved. So the money is set aside. It's ready to go. As soon as that contract signed, Tammy can process that part. I mean, it takes, you know, the normal execution, but we will be ready when that contract is ready to go. So I don't so, know if you have any other questions on that or the scope of work for the project. A question that I have is that, you know, things, from a federal standpoint and money standpoint have been kind of swirling for a while <laughs> yes. what's going on. And so is there any chance at all that this money no. is not going to be available? No, and exactly. ODOT is committed. So we have to spend our federal highway money every year. This money, we're glad it's earmarked for this and it will, it actually already went to our federal highway people for approval. So we already have we the money. We have it. It's not spent yet, but it's allocated, if you will. Okay. It's already budgeted just for this item. Who is this John U.S.? Is this a Houston? Okay. That's my boss. And is he a elected official or no, appointed or what? He's a employed area manager. Um, He's an engineer and he's in charge of the entire area. We have about 10 project managers like myself. So if he shows up not working in this position anymore, whatever he says here is binding. Yes. Okay. And right now it's, we hope John is, you know, continues in this position. I mean, definitely there's, 
I don't see a lot of changes because they actually have some hiring freezes on and stuff within the agency. So. Well, you know, this, the city does not have the money for this. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that we are going to get the money. That we're not writing you a bad check. Yes, That's I understand. Right. <laughs> I, I, I don't like NSS. <laughs> So I just wanted to make sure that we know where you live. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and even the contract kind of reads that way. I just went through and really read it. And normally um, it references in there some local agency, certified local agencies. With those, those are truly reimbursable where the agencies have to pay the money up front. This contract doesn't really say that. It says you're going to invoice us, but it doesn't say you have to show that you already spent it. So that's why it's more of a pass-through, which also kind of facilitates that. Well, I, don't, I don't have a problem yeah. with the pass-through as long as the money to pass through is there. Yes. You know, and, that's and that's what I just gave uh, Gordon because, then, I mean, uh, Preston, because really our stiff improvement is a statewide transportation improvement plan. It's approved by the Transportation Commission. In order for me to move that money, I had to take it from construction, file an amendment. It took about several weeks and get it approved by Federal Highway. So it wasn't a simple thing. <laughs> also within your contract, it says if there's a reason, first of all, we've made this what we believe generous based on some things, sure. you know, in sure. so we anticipate that that's going to be plenty of money. Sure. Even if it wasn't within your contract, it says Tammy has the authority to approve increments of increases, and those are all at the expense of the project and ODA. Yeah, because I know for a fact some of the projects that we've done in those areas have come up where the um, lines and different things aren't where yes. they're supposed to be, and things like oil tanks showing mm -hmm. where we didn't know they were in that type Has, of stuff. Has not yet so, there, so there is a little bit of leeway here in case yes. there's change orders. It say. is. And and like you said, I think Gordon's done a good job of incorporating. We've, we've included pay for him to administer that project when it's actually in construction. Um, our project will be out here in some areas, so we also will be coordinating um, one of the people that was involved in this conversation is my construction and project delivery person. So we will have people that even that way can make sure, because we need it to be successful. We don't want it to hold up the paving project either. So, you know, even going forward, there's going to be kind of a, an ongoing coordination as far as that staging and execution of that work. What is your estimate that you're going to have 99 down? Yes. How so, long do you figure that? That we're not going to be able to I actually I brought to some to information to leave for public information as well. And I also have some website links. We're going to be um, doing some other outreach with that. I may wait until right now the bid is supposed to award to a contractor in October. So I may wait till then so we can actually say who it's going to be. Um, as I mentioned, they would receive their contract by the end of the year with probably a notice to go ahead and start in January. Mostly including, they've got to do 100 ADA ramps between here and McMendo. So that's going to be the one for probably the first four months. As it gets into the different cities, we will be probably having about at least a once a month update of what that schedule is. When that's happening, it's going to be a single lane traffic control. They won't close it every day, but if they need to work on that curb return, they're going to put you know, cones and temporary stuff out, and then at the end of the day, pull it off. And it'll be daytime work. Um, There's not going to be any nighttime work? There will be nighttime work. So the shoulders and, and concrete is more daytime. Right. Then when we get into summer, I'm predicting June, July for that dig out. Part of it will be depend on that the uh, water line project is on track. When we get that contractor on board, they really give us a confirmation. So they kind of set the final schedule. So mine's a guess based on the workload. Sure. They're telling me four weeks. I've estimated up to eight weeks. So during that time, when it's torn up, cars will still be able to go through. A lot of that work will be at night. Uh, businesses will be accommodated as much as possible. Uh -huh. Biggest thing impact you will have is occasionally the cross streets are going to be closed until that work's completed. Okay. So they're going to have to go through and like, dig out, dig out, dig out, cross streets are closed, and then come back in and do that side and restore it and put it back, and then shift over and do the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For residential traffic or local traffic, mm -hmm. it's going to be a 12-foot width. There'll be, you know, plastic delineators out there, so we can work within it. The biggest thing is 
because of that grade difference, mm -hmm. there's not, a, we can't accommodate anything else. So sure. um, we're going to prohibit, if you will, oversized, any oversized loads that would need to come through. So we've already went to mobility and freight and said, you know, you're got to go around. So just so oversized. Oversized, yes. Yeah. And we can still accommodate some of their normal loads because they have, normally this is permitted for the annual permits for 14 feet, which is usually a 12 foot load, but with clearance. So except for that tearing up of the downtown, those loads will still be able to go. So it's only that, you know, like I said, they're gonna be in and out of there. They don't want it torn up longer than it needs to be, but it, it's not gonna be fun. It's gonna be a mess for sure. probably a couple months. <laughs> Well, now, the nice thing is it'll look great when it's all done. It'll look, it'll, it'll look beautiful. <laughs> and you're getting the new crosswalk with the light down yeah. at Monroe, so mm -hmm. there's some nice improvements. Yes. Yeah. So. Permanent markings on the yes. walks. Upgraded crosswalks with the continental striping. So. so is there anything else we need to talk about? Anybody have any questions? <sighs> Sheila? No, I'm assuming that I'm going to see a lot of increased traffic on 2nd Street. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, we need to adjust the suggested motion. And what we need to do is change when it says construction agreement and authorize the mayor to sign the agreement. We need to um, get rid of the statement from agreement and and then change the agreements um, to do we want to leave the schedule September in there? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So here here's a here's a motion. Oh you oh you wrote it again. Sheila, okay. are you the you want are you want to do the motion maybe? Yeah. Uh, Let me get my fogged glasses uh, right here. I move to approve the ODOT utility construction agreement and authorize the mayor to sign. And to schedule or to schedule in September a hearing and supplemental budget consideration by the budget committee to add this project capital improvement program to be completed in the current fiscal year. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, pass. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Is that like a repeat? repeat of the yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be in touch with the additional, you know, follow up on the project stuff. All righty. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, pandemic policies. This is the same thing that we talked about last week, last month. And, it's, and we're going to have it every month for a couple of months because we don't need to talk about it. First thing that I wanted to talk about is um, this free face covering. Has everybody got that? Mm -hmm. So if you need face masks or something, there's a place in Sheridan, Newburgh, and McKinsey. They're giving out free first come, first serve while supplies last adult size masks. So if any of your constituents or anything need this information, let them know that um, it's available. Okay. Um, declaration of an emergency. Um, I don't think that we should change that until the governor takes it off. I think we should leave it the way it, leave ours the way it is. Does everybody agree with that and want to talk about it? I thought I agree with that. That the governor, but she's the one calling shots. So <laughs> um, the restaurant relief program. Do we want to continue that? Do we want to stop it? Or what would you like to do with that? I have a question. For the for August, it says there were only five. Well, it's only the third. That's, well, that's what I was wondering. Is that just because it's you haven't gotten all those back yet? Uh, well, the packet was put together last Thursday. So okay. that's, that's, the, okay. that's why. That's only five. No, no, no. Uh, there's been a bunch more come in. You bet. I don't think it's costing us enough money to to um, quit doing it. Yeah. I think I think goodwill. just leaving it its goodwill. Yeah. Not only for the businesses, but also I think it shows um, that the city cares mm -hmm. and wants to support the businesses. So I don't have I a don't. problem leaving it going. Okay. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. 
City Hall Parks and Community Centers. They are what they are. Um, <laughs> the City Hall is set up to one person at a time, which seems to be working well. Do you have any problems with that, Preston? Uh, very rare. People are pretty understanding. Uh, there's been a few that don't want to wear a mask. I mean, you know, but for the most part, uh, people are very accommodating and, and they're understanding. Yeah. The community center, has it gotten, it's still closed. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, city parks, they're open. Has anybody noticed anything in the parks? I haven't seen activity. I haven't been out either. Well, Joel Perkins Park is being used quite a bit by a lot of, um, um, what is it? Um, people that are uh, child care. Places. Child care. I mean, I've been up there, and every time I've been up there, the playground has just been full of children. So it so it's being used quite a bit. It's good. So that's good. At least they're getting out. They need it. And going, you know, and they're yeah. outside where it's not so bad. There's no changes in any of the park recommendations, is there, um, from the, the, the governor, is there? No. I haven't seen any. That's right. And the, re and the restrooms are going to remain closed? Yeah. Right. To... There's been no change in that. Okay. Um, okay, then anything else about those, those um, facilities, guys? Okay. Gatherings under the phase two, HOA, street closures, garage sale permits, um, soliciting permits. How many of those are, have been issued in the last three months? None. Okay. You know, well, I, which ones? Solicitor permits. Right. Uh, so they've lowered the attendance level. What two? What is the number of the community? indoor private events is like 10 people 10, in your house? 10, okay. Correct, I think 100 per major gathering. You still have to have a yeah. 36 right. square feet per person. Okay. Right. Uh, I don't think we should be issuing soliciting permits. No. I don't think we ever do, so that's fine. <laughs> I, I think no, we do every summer, way. we do every summer, but it's not, not my uh, uh, I, I wouldn't approve it. You know, and that's my inclination. And uh, unless you think of something different, it's it's, uh, it's completely different than a garage sale where you're inviting people. Yeah, yeah. This is not invitation, basically. Uh, so uh, I think I think because of the uptick in the number of cases in the Ideal County, I think anything that we can keep from outside yep. outside people or things coming into the city, I think the best the better off we are. Well, yeah, and people you don't even know coming to your door. Exactly. Right? No. Uh, I do realize that, you know, this doesn't stop solicitors. No. Right. But it just it narrows yeah. the, the ones that are supposed to get a permit. It doesn't they stop don't. it, but it does. It also doesn't say, okay, do it. Like, for instance, if somebody walked up to my house and had a permit, I would say, oh, the city says this guy's okay. Because they've got a permit. And because he's got a permit, and I don't agree with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, here we did the real nice process of permits and everything. Okay. And, and, you know, and, <laughs> but no, it's it's all good. It's just uh, we'll. Uh, well, I question. I question the garage sale that went on in July 11th when um, it was displayed that there was 25 people that had a garage sale, and I know for a fact that we only had like 13 permits. So somebody's not getting the idea out there that they need a permit for the garage sale. Which we might want to reiterate that in the newsletter. We can. Yeah. I think just a reminder. Because there was a reason why we set up permits for the um, for garage sales is so that we wouldn't we didn't have a hundred at one time and also there were people that were having um, a garage sale every every month, and they were selling food and different things like that. So I know that there was reason why we had the garage sale permit. So I think it's something we should stay with. Okay, number five. Looking ahead, I don't know if there's anything we need to discuss with that. 
Uh, nothing new, Your Honor. Okay. That's it. So on the subject, though, Your Honor, a couple of things uh, regarding the COVID. Uh, uh, we received a second uh, reimbursement from the state for supplies and equipment. Oh, uh, and uh, so we received a total of about uh, uh, $6,500, give or take, uh, uh, now to reimburse for related expenses. Uh, and, and as part of the supplemental budget next month, we will have council recognize those money so we can put those back in the budget. Uh, can we use that money that for PPE for the council so we can get some face shields for the council? I think so. Can we well, that? I mean, not this money. We use other money. Whatever money yeah. we need to. Because you bet. These, I don't know about you guys, but these are uncomfortable. Other than the fact I can't breathe. That's yeah. Simple. Well, uh, right now I'm just going... The problem is when I talk, it just comes off my nose and goes down my chin. <laughs> and I'm constantly well, pulling it up. To. I know, but it's supposed to, it's supposed to stay where it's supposed to be, you know, but then you're touching it and that kind of is counterintuitive of what it's supposed to be doing. Like, so. can, can you see we can get some of those? Well, we can't. We, we absolutely can. So if you want them, let me know. Thank you. I you appreciate it. Uh, How about you guys? Would no. you guys go for those? Yeah. 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 They shield. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, Your Honor, is uh, uh, we're, we'll come back uh, with council probably here next month to do a policy regarding sick leave, uh, COVID related. And, and there's been a reclassification of uh, our public works employees as emergency responders. Mm -hmm. And so they're handled differently. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of sick leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it doesn't it doesn't affect the employer at all. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it says that uh, 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 that employees if okay. they I just moved in my whole chair. <laughs> oh, what the hell? oh you shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I'm awake, I promise. <laughs> well it's so so it's uh, it's just a good policy and uh, CIS recommends it and that came to our attention and you know, they're changing the rules, they're doing a lot of things there, and we want to reclassify our employees as such and 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 make this benefit available to them. Okay. It, it, if they get sick on the job and they lose time, it's not credited against them personally, you see. So uh, either... Any kind of sickness or the COVID or... The COVID. The COVID stuff, okay. Right, right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, they get yeah. it while... As emergency responder, as our classification of public works, you know, they get mm -hmm. sick on the job, they have to miss work, they don't have to use their personal time. Mm -hmm. uh, does, that, does that also, how does, does that work with the volunteers on the fire department? Well, they're, they don't have sick leave. Okay. They don't have, they're not compensated okay. uh, like that for like salary employees. It's, uh, so this would not apply to them. Okay. Uh, yeah, so would the employees, public works or whoever, have to prove that they were exposed on the job? Or probably, is it just oh, probably, and, and you know, and, <laughs> uh, but that's, I work at a hospital and I can't prove that. I'm sure public works is not going to be able to prove that. Throw <laughs> well, that out there. That well, right, it's a great and, idea. But well, you know, I think the contact who's the people, whether they call that when they trace call that trace. trace, those people can tell you probably where you got yeah. it. Yeah. Now, it, it doesn't mean employees will be compensated for that leave. It only means you, know, you don't have to use your, against your uh, uh, personal time. Right. You see. Uh, uh, so uh, so it's, not, it's not a financial burden on the city. It's just a good policy for the employees, and that's what we need to do. So, so that will come back to you next month. Uh, on that, and uh, I just want to, it's related, so I thought I'd mention that. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, public works. Any questions about public works? I've noticed a couple of leaks in here. Is there any of those any are significant? No, uh, one was kind of expensive out in the corner of uh, Jefferson and Second. Uh, that was an expensive leak, but none of them have been substantial. Why was it expensive? Uh, we had to hire a leak detecting firm to come in and sleuth that. 
uh, and we're going to have to dig up the street. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, so it's it, how extensive is the leak? Well, we're not going to know exactly until we get in there, but at least we we know where it's at now. That's not part of the new Jefferson improvement, is it? Uh, we, we just finished. It, well, it's it's in, it's in the intersection of Second and Jefferson, so it's kind so of outside, but kind it's of close. Part of, but not. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, it won't affect the sidewalks or nothing, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, but uh, isn't that where the um, where the fire station is? No, it's the other side. The no, oh, side that's side. Fourth and Jefferson. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, so. confused. <laughs> right, right. Now the 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 one interesting uh, point about the public works report now is that we have Mac Water and Light showing up on our water production, and mm -hmm. thanks, Doug, for Again, for keeping up on our tallies, pardon me, uh, our tallies and everything, uh, he added a column for Mac Water and Light production to go into uh, uh, our reports. So thank you for that, Doug. It's it's a partial month. It's not a full month, but it's uh, it's uh, significant. And and I, I tell you, it's not a moment too soon either. Uh, Has Clayton been able to tell us why the joint system is still losing? Water? We don't know what it is. Well, their, their own data says it. Right. Uh, it's not accounted for. Right. Uh, Doug's referring to their numbers, which have always been very close, and now they've been off for well, actually, a long time. I, I, uh, actually, I think what it is is they're actually generating more water. Than, or the, yeah, the production is less than what is being used. Which is actually know, the worst. I really think that it's it's in the metering. Well, that's that's Dayton's system. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, they, they, they haven't gone through their meters like we have, have they? Let's see. We did. I don't think we did all. Uh, they've adopted a different uh standard for their meters but they are replacing them and they're they're they've already started whereas we're not going to start until probably next fiscal year uh so so they're looking at uh, uh upgrading all of their meters too well our loss dropped 12 uh almost well, 11 11 percent just from the small amount of time that we used um the uh, map water and light thing. Yeah. I'm really going to be interested to see what it's going to come down to when we have a full month with this stuff, especially August. Right. Yeah. Well, Marie, when you when you called me and asked about that, that was very astute because it, it, you know logically, if you could say, which you did, was uh, you know it looks like we're losing water in that line from Dayton. <laughs> It very well could be uh, something we can't detect, that we walked it and everything with our equipment and consultants and everything. But, uh, you know, again, this is only a partial month. You know, uh, we're going to have data every month that we can build on. But well, one of that's, two things is happening. We're either losing water in that line or that line isn't calibrating or calculating correctly about the amount of water that's coming over. Could be As a combination. Of Could be all that, yeah. and and we won't really have a great handle on our uh, transmission lines coming into the city until we do our CIP uh, for all of our uh, meters and boxes, and that's uh, uh, CIP uh, number uh, uh, number eight, which we postponed last year to finish the pump station. So that's ready to bid. But as we as we chip off that thirty three percent, I mean, if it continues to go down as we use it, and then it goes back up in the winter, let's say when we start using it, then that's going to show a real. Um, it's going to really show us something. It is. You bet it is, Marie, and that's that's uh, that may lead us in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You bet. Um, so. Okay. So we've done. Have we? Yeah. Fire. Do we have anything, Christine? That has anybody walked through the new fire station? Yeah. Pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. Pretty exciting, isn't it? It's How starting much, to get a personality. Yeah. 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 How much yeah. longer? How, where are we at in our in our? Are we October, November? What? Uh, well, I just met with uh, 
Ray, Dying the Project Manager, and Troy today with Kevin and and uh, and, and and they're looking at being substantial <laughs> by the around the end of October. October, so, great. Uh, so it's uh, it's going to start really taking shape and character here fast and uh and i know they've been meeting with cnd about the landscape i said don't wait till the end landscaping is as important as the roll-up doors don't wait till the end uh so uh, uh you know they're gonna get a certificate of occupancy when it's all done like everybody else we're not cutting corners on that so uh, so they are working to get that done and looking nice and it's great. I had an interesting situation when I was working in Eugene where they did a extremely large pump station. They had it all landscaped and came back the next day and someone had come in and stole all the plants. <laughs> oh man. Oh. oh. Well, you know, I did you know, I had that happen. I'm working on a house over here and the painters had all of the cabinet doors out in the carport. Uh-huh. Drying, and I drove by one morning, and they were all gone. Okay. And I'm going, oh my god, stole all my doors. <laughs> they put them inside. Okay. Um, administrative. Well, thanks, Your Honor. I've uh, I've got four items. Uh, some are more involved. Uh, but uh, number one, uh, the September meeting. Now we're looking at having a budget committee hearing. Uh, uh, um, we need to get a quorum together for the budget committee. We'll start, you know, getting people lined up for all of that. Uh, we'll update our CIP. We'll also be looking for council to give us pre-authorization to award that contract when it comes in on September 17th. If what not, contract? this is for the work that Gordon will be bidding the ODOT contract, okay, the ODOT contract. for the gotcha. supplemental budget. Okay. So, so uh, those bids would be open on the 17th. Uh, the council meets on the 10th, unless you want to have a special meeting. Uh, well, we're are we going to have the budget and the council meeting the same You've time? You've got it. In. Okay. It'll all Great. be part of the council meeting there and, and, and budget committee will, uh, will advertise it accordingly. Yep. And, and so we would also be asking at that time for council to pre-authorize the award of that project based on the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, so we don't lose approximately three weeks coming back to council for that. So uh, does, does ODA have to okay that too because they're paying for it or? Uh, they, no. They're going to approve the bid specs and, okay. and, and all. And, yeah, which includes the you know all the contractor specifications there. So, do you have so, a projected date for the budget committee meeting? It would be at the council meeting on, okay, on so September we'll 10th. Yeah, 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 we're going to do it together. To change any of the okay. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, uh, unless you want to have a special meeting at the end of September to do the okay. So we're gonna. I'll be asking for that next month with the supplemental budget. Council authorize that. Uh, uh, ODOT's like, hey, we're going to pay whatever it is, you know. Uh, but likely that amount will be more like um, the 700000 plus our extra project to send the lives. That's another 120000 And we're going to probably add another 120000 just to make sure we're not holding the bag and everything, you know, at the end. So, uh, uh, so uh, that's the strategy. And um, and so that's next month. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work all doing this. And, and, and I got to tell you, I, I, I laughed when, uh, when ODOT suggested, oh, well, just have someone in your finance department do all the paperwork. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Yeah, I'm the finance department, okay? okay. Uh, welcome to small cities in Oregon. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing, Going down the list here. Uh, had a meeting with Dayton uh, this week, uh, our monthly uh, joint water ses session uh, meetings and, and all. And we talked about uh, the SCADA system that we're uh, uh, designing at, at, at the moment now. And, uh, and the production of the joint well system is, is diminishing. And we expect that to happen over the summer, happens every summer. You use those pumps, uh, you know, almost 24-7, seven days a week. Uh, over time, they 
you know, you use up the aquifer, you use up the pumps, it diminishes. Uh, well, they've gotten a lot of rest these last month. It's still going down. You know, they're down to 330 gallons a minute now, which is typical of uh, this time of year. It starts uh, closer to 400 in June. By the time you get to September, you're, you're pulling three, you know. So, um, uh, so it's interesting that we're given lots of time for the pumps to recover, yet we're still diminishing in our production. So that's, again, it's only a partial month, but I think that goes to say that, uh, uh, you know, the aquifer is diminishing. It's not an equipment issue. It's, a, it's, it's just the state of the aquifer during these summer months. Uh, uh, but, but we always thought it was a combination equipment and aquifer. Well, it's kind of looking now that it's just the aquifer is not. Does that affect our maintenance agreement? Uh, not a whole lot, Doug. Uh, uh, yeah. How yeah. yeah. much we use. So certain things are 50% straight. But, well, this is I'm talking about. They, we actually have a maintenance rehab. rehab. The well right. producing. They'll go in and refurbish it. Oh, you're talking about the service contract. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, they, they come in twice okay. a year. You're, you're right. <laughs> yeah, they do a full rehab uh, uh, in the spring. And in the wintertime, they come back and check things. You okay. know, and sometimes they do rehab and all that uh, uh and uh my my guess is uh, you know that's i mean it's not increasing you know yeah you know and and, and we knew that but uh, uh so uh, uh the other thing on my list is uh uh, uh we're looking at uh, having a water resources committee meeting on october 6th uh and and the chairman of the meeting, Chris Harper, asked me to bring that up since he's not here tonight. But uh, we're looking at that being the final meeting of the Water Resources Committee. Uh, and uh, and I might have to have pizza at that meeting yeah. or something. But okay, yeah, we can't go to Roadhouse. I'm not buying anybody beer. But <laughs> but it's it's we've been talking about how this gets wrapped and and so. Uh, uh, we'll, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about current projects. We're going to talk about going forward. We might look back at the last ten years a bit. That'll get done. That'll basically be over. The, and uh, Chairman Harper will report to Council at the uh, on uh, that would be October eighth at your regular meeting. Uh, and uh, and it's it, it's it's been nearly ten years to the month at that point. Wow, what a ride! And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Everybody, you know, looking forward to it. Todd and Richard and everybody. And uh, I tell you, it's just, it's a tremendous thing. And and uh, so uh, that's kind of the plan. I wanted to, Chris wanted to mention it to you tonight. Uh, we'll advertise that along with our newsletter and everything else. And, you know, and maybe some people might want to show up for that. Uh, the last thing, uh, oh, I got, uh, 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 the Pumpkin Fest is, is also on my list. And uh, we normally do that in September. Or pardon me, we do that in October. Mm -hmm. But we have to decide what we're going to do now. And so uh, what we would like to do is not like what we've done before, but we want to keep up the whole idea of giving people pumpkins and goodie bags and and we'll have it all set up so that in the cars they can come through they can get their goodie bags they can get their treats they can get their pumpkins and and drive right on through and no carving you know at this point but we want to keep that going and we think that's a good way to do it what do you think of that I think that's an excellent okay. Yeah. Rather than having to cancel it, and yeah. at least no. at least this way, there's going to be something there. You bet. You bet. Yeah. We think we can do that fine and be safe and and help and so that's what we're going to plan. Okay, great. Uh, uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, regarding our uh, wastewater treatment plant. We've got I've got four things to bring up. Uh, uh, one is. Uh, we uh, we're finishing this week with the biosolids program, 119 tons being spread uh, 
uh, we've uh, I got one call from folks going, what are what is going on? The plan, and so I explained it to them, and that was that was all real nice inquiry. Uh, but uh, uh, this is our annual program. It's taken them about two weeks, and then that we're done until next summer. That's going to continue for at least three more summers. At that point, we reevaluate where we're at. How much do we have? How much do the farmers want? We'll kind of, and at that point, we could do something different. But it's a kind of a five-year program. We're going to complete year two this week, and it's gone real smooth. So, uh, the uh, uh, we got we got a penalty from DEQ. We know it's coming. About ten months now, we've known it's coming. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, the cost of the penalty, civil penalty, is twelve thousand two hundred fifty-five bucks. Uh, we're going to, which really is uh, could have been so much worse. You know, uh, we're getting Dean for being out of compliance for fourteen years, so that's hard to swallow. What was out of compliance? It's it's portions of the plant that that. Uh, uh, you know, we've got uh, mainly, well, you have out of compliance because we didn't have staff for a time uh, for some reporting and testing. Uh, but, but when it comes to being out of compliance for all that time, it has to do with the level of our plant and what it was designed at. And uh, we talked about this a little bit before where uh, when the plant went in, you know, to operation, uh, part of it wasn't engineered properly. We, we sued the engineer, the city uh, uh, received a judgment, a court order to do it differently. Uh, uh, the uh, DEQ had approved the entire design, which the judge threw out. DEQ don't care about that. Yeah, they, they, they just, they, so in our recent permit, every five years you get your discharge renewal permit. We've kept that up every five years. We get gold stars, we do lots of good things. This last one, which that period just got finished this summer, the five year, we are officially a type, a level three treatment plant moving forward. Uh, uh, and, and we accept that. Uh, we budgeted for it, et cetera. But, but to get dinged for all that time is, is difficult to swallow, but I'm not arguing the amounts at all. But what we're doing at staff is we're going to appeal it. We're going to go explain the circumstances and propose a project to spend most of this money on something at the plant. It's not a compliance thing, but this is how it works. I've never been through it, but our consultants have. And so we will be, we will be uh, proposing something to, for, you know, seven, $8,000 so that most of that fine, or at least half that fine, could be used to invest on something at the plant. So, uh, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, nobody likes to get fined. Uh, uh, you might recall how our operator went out on leave April first and never come back. <laughs> and 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 the hardest position to to find in local government is wastewater treatment plant operator. It's been that way for 30 years and it has not changed. Uh, we were never without a certified operator. The day he resigned, I hired someone that day. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, in fact, DEQ, what could we have done differently? Well, nothing. We did all the right. It doesn't matter. You're out of compliance. So, it, you know, it's a little frustrating, but, but I, I'm not... I'm going to be very respectful to them, not dispute any of the penalties, but explain our circumstances and then propose a project. So uh, it's we finally, after 10 months, we finally got the word. And so uh, I'll we'll let you know how that, you know, plays out. Um, the uh, wastewater treatment plant, we recently had an incident. Well, we'll probably get fined. Uh, we had an illegal dumping going on in one of our yeah. one of our uh, manholes. It was either you know, and and uh, I think we we had the same thing 
about this time last year. And so uh, we kind of narrowed it down what it was, but there was chemicals dumped that destroy the bacteria in our plant. They're not completely destroyed. One basin is recovering, the other one's okay, but it messes up everything. It messes up everything. And so we'll want to put something in our newsletter about don't be dumping in the manholes. And if you see anybody, call 911. Very stiff penalties. Uh, uh, and, and so it's, you know, we've done so much, so much great work down there and to have something like that happen. It, it just really is a, you know, a, a dagger in the heart, you know, and the, these guys have, uh, well, the last thing I wanted to mention is you remember the rags, we talked about the rags and how we're twice a day, our crew has to fish out the rags because of the breakdown of our uh, right. head works, our, our screen works and all. And it's, it's taken almost three, well, well, close to three months now. Uh, but we've got it all working now really well. There's one automated gearbox we got we to gotta get so it can work automated. But, uh, you know, these guys have been incredible. And, 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 and twice a day, every day, it has to be done. And, and we're with the new system that they put in and designed, working with our consultant and everything. Uh, uh, we, had, we had plugged in $300,000 next year to do our headworks rebuild. We're not looking at that cost anymore. Okay. Excellent. You know, it really is excellent. And so a lot of information on the wastewater treatment uh, situation. And uh, I can't, you know, I mean, I can't be prouder of the crew and where we're at with our treatment plant right now. Uh, most of all the things DEQ mentioned to us to fix, we already did them before they even pointed out to us. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, you were out of compliance for a certain time. So, you know, uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's the, my report, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. that. Okay. Many reports. Um, anything for the Parks Committee? Um, counselors, any other counselors have anything to say? Okay. I just have a couple of things that I want to say. Um, we received another letter from the um, insurance company of the LOC about that insurance um, that we had a presentation for for the insurance for the line for your um, sewer lines and water lines to your houses and stuff like that. And I would request that we revisit that and see if they can come and give us another um, another um, presentation on it and revisit it. Is that okay with you guys? Can, can we do that? I can uh, try and arrange it. You bet. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, um, another thing is um, the parks, at least the Grant Street Park, Joel Perkins, and the little um, Commons Park, they're really coming along nicely. We've got our little Christmas tree in there. Oh, that is so cute. I wanted to go put a Christmas ornament on it. Yeah. <laughs> it you know, we got a smaller one because evidently with the root ball that it, the way it is, if we got a bigger one, it could be damaged in shipping and it might not grow where the little ones will grow. And it'll grow a um, foot or two a year. So in probably five years, we'll be have a nice big Christmas tree that we can have our um, Christmas um uh, our Christmas festive there. But anyway, other than that, um, I think that that's all I wanted to talk about. Kevin, I need a, an executive session thing. Thank you. It got stuck to something on the back of my desk, and I didn't realize it didn't make it into your, your body. Oh, good job. Okay, so um, that's the last thing that I have for the meeting. Um, if you want to, shall we go right into an executive session? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> The Lafayette City Council will now meet in executive session for the purpose of conducting deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. All members of the audience are asked to leave the room. No formal decision will be made in the executive session. For those watching the meeting via the YouTube stream, there will be a break, a break in the stream. 
At the close of the executive session, the council will return to open session and the YouTube stream live stream will restart. Thank you. So I'm closing the session and opening the executive session.